the Arts Commission to New Heights and I'm happy to pass the baton at this this stage but it was it's been very enjoyable especially uh, with all we've done we've acquired the uh, sidewalk judge who <laughs> which has been outstanding throughout the world since I know that from volunteering at the Yonville Chamber and also uh, in the performing arts with our gem of the Lincoln Theater you know it so we've got a stronger link. We've uh, increased all our documentation, which will benefit the Arts Commission and networking going forward with a lot of synergy in the future. So this is going to benefit our Yonville citizens and also our wonderful visitors. Thanks so much. You're very welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Also, I want to recognize uh, he was unable to be with us here uh, in the room tonight, but uh, Mikkel Tigret from our Zoning and Design Review Board, who served on that board from August 2015 to till July of 2019. So we want to recognize uh, Mikkel for his uh, service to the town of Yonville. So thank him very much. Yes. <laughs> and we will get that certificate to him. Next, we would like to recognize the efforts of a particular family and business um, that we uh, get to call our local uh, residents and out of town nearby residents. Um, or I'll be presenting a proclamation recognizing uh, the ninth total year of the Crush Cancer Napa Valley efforts. And I want to invite up the Jordan family to join me at the podium to receive this recommendation or this commendation. Love the spotlight. A portion of it. Yeah, that's, I know, and there are more of you than this. Yeah. But this is a, a proclamation in recognition of the Crush Cancer Napa Valley. Whereas more than 1.7 million new cancer cases are expected to be diagnosed in the United States in 2019, 187,000 of which are estimated to be in California. Whereas about half of the people diagnosed with cancer face financial hardship because of their diagnosis, with some survivors spending more than 20% of their annual income on care. Whereas beginning in 2010 with Sisters Crush Breast Cancer and co-organizer Thomas Willows, the Jordan family has led a dynamic effort to raise funds and awareness in support of cancer patients. Whereas the organization now known as Crush Cancer Napa Valley and expanded to assist all cancer diagnoses, has raised over $200,000 in its mission to assist local cancer patients by providing funds for basic necessities and nutrition support, including groceries, utilities, child care, and transportation to ease the burden for patients and their caregivers. Whereas the ninth annual event this year features an expanded two-day format including a silent auction, dinner, and live auction on August 10th, followed by the annual 5K run walk on August 11th. Crush Cancer Napa Valley also raises funds during cocktail month in October from all specialty crush cocktails sold at restaurant partner Bistro Don Giovanni. Now therefore, let it be resolved that I, John F. Dunbar, mayor of the town of Yonville, along with the entire town council, do hereby recognize the dedication of the Jordan family to raise money in support of the fight against cancer. And we thank the organizers and participants of Crush Cancer Napa Valley. If you please share. I will. I, just as we all know, I, some of you don't. I do not like to speak, but I do thank everyone for the support, recognition, hopefully, We'll sell a few more tickets. I'm going to leave. I'm gonna, I 
come in my uniform. I'm never shamed. I mean, I never have any shame. I just want you to sign up, join us next weekend, walk with us, buy from our amazing, or bid on our amazing auction lots. We've got huge things in our lots. And if nothing else, if you don't walk, if you don't eat dinner with us, come and bid on the auction lots. There's 50 to 60 amazing things. So um, thank you to everybody. And I'm going to leave my little flyers at the door. And thanks for the support of the Green Peace for this 12 years now. Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Yes, if you're not aware, Sisters Boutique up in the V Marketplace is uh, also uh, part of the Jordan family's efforts to be a great part of Yonville. So thank you all very much. Now we get to recognize uh, some of our own team. Uh, again, those that hate the spotlight, but we make them do it when uh, they just can't hide from the recognition they deserve. This is in recognition of the uh, finance department for receiving the government finance officers association certificate of achievement for excellence in finance financial reporting for the town's comprehensive annual financial report for fiscal year 2017 through 2018 and that's a very long award <laughs> and it's also a very heavy award but uh, I would like to invite Celia King, our finance manager, to please come up to the podium so I can uh, pre present this award. Good to see you. Thank you. Sorry we made you stay late. <laughs> but this does uh, recognize from the Gover Government Finance Officers Association the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting presented to the Town of Yonville. And I will just notice uh, that we have one circle coming next for 2019, and we still have room more to follow. So we look forward to continued excellence from you and the entire team. So thank you very much. Thank you. There you go. If you'd like to share any thoughts. Sure. I'll just say thank you, of course, to the mayor and the town council for recognizing staff efforts and um, for your guidance and support in always remaining fiscally responsible. And we will, of course, continue to strive for excellence in financial reporting. Thank, Thank you. you. So when we get to our budget season and we, we have our workshops and spend countless hours as a staff and a council and we, we get to what's always been a balanced budget, there's so much work that goes into it behind the scenes uh, in the office with Celia and others on our staff. And it's great that not only when we can recognize you, but when you, the industry recognizes all those efforts as well. So congratulations. Next up is public comment on any item that is not on our agenda for tonight. So if there's something that uh, any one of you would like to bring forward to the council, now would be the time. Seeing no one come forward, we'll move ahead to our consent calendar. We have four items on that calendar. If there is no question or comment about them, is there a motion to adopt the consent calendar as presented? I, I move to approve the consent calendar. Did we get that button pushed? Well, I keep pushing, but it doesn't go. Okay, now I think we have a motion. Is there a second we can try? A second. Okay, it looks like it might be working this time. Now we wait. We'll just do a voice vote again. All in favor of the consent calendar? Aye. 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 That passes unanimously. Next, we do have a presentation, uh, our CAL FIRE Public Safety Quarterly Report. Welcome. Sorry, no plaque, no certificate of appreciation, just information. That's all right. All right. The uh, folks that were uh, recognized earlier uh, done some extraordinary things, so I, I'm glad that they got the wine and the plaques. Uh, Anyway, uh, Mayor Dunbar, uh, Jeff, and members of the council, uh, Jeff Bellier, the county fire chief, and I'm happy to present to you tonight the uh, second quarter uh, report for your town fire station, the Yonville Fire Station. Uh, so uh, for our second quarter, uh, the, the fire station ran approximately 487 calls out of the station. Uh, as you can see, they were broke down uh, 
you look at the lower left uh, pie graph, about 252 of them, just about 51% of the calls that were run out of that fire, our fire, your fire station, uh, were to the Veterans Home of California. Uh, one call was to the city of Napa. <coughs> Excuse me. About 145 calls were to the unincorporated areas of the county surrounding the town, and then 89 calls were within the town limits. Uh, so that is slightly up uh, from our previous year and also uh, slightly up from the five-year average for, for the same period of time. Uh, as is pretty much a, a national trend, the majority of the calls are made up of medical aids and then uh, smattering of residential structure fires, uh, how, uh, vegetation fires, vehicle fires, traffic collisions, and uh, public assists. That rounds out your uh, total call volume. Uh, some of the significant uh, incidents that folks or personnel from Yauntville Station responded to, uh, as many of you know, Yauntville Station also is, houses our county's uh, technical rescue team. Uh, their expertise were utilized uh, earlier on a fuel truck tanker that had rolled over on Mount St. Helena was holding about 5,000 gallons of fuel. They, our technical rescue team worked in conjunction with our hazmat team to safely offload all 5,000 gallons of fuel out of the overturned vehicle into uh, a cleanup contractor's uh, vacuum truck and then hauled that fuel away safely. There were no injuries, no um, appreciable loss of um, any of the gasoline or diesel fuel that could have presented any hazards to the environment or any of the downstream waterways uh, downhill from that. That was about a 16-hour event and um, was uh, very, very uh, safely mitigated. Um, another significant event, obviously, was the unfortunate fire that happened at our fleet maintenance facility. Um, we won't dwell on that too much, but both uh, units from Yauntville uh, were there to help not only with the fire suppression, but then again, members of the rescue team went back up the next day to help stabilize the building so that our fire investigators could take a look at it, determine the fire uh, origin and cause. Uh, again, uh, more with the rescue folks uh, doing some very specialized high angle rescue training at our training tower uh, just across the valley at the base of Rector Dam, as well as participating in a multi-county uh, rescue uh, drill at the Monticello Dam with about 10 other fire agencies. Uh, that's a very significant and very um, taxing and challenging uh, rescue drill that our folks attend uh, annually. Uh, also, i um, like to point out that in between running emergencies and training for the next emergency, the folks at our station also provide uh, hands-only CPR training to any members of the public or businesses. In fact, we encourage any businesses within the community or residents that would like to learn hands-only CPR, uh, please call the station, uh, set up a time where you can come and get uh, trained on that. Uh, American Heart Association does uh, has uh, significant statistics that show that just hands-only CPR, in other words, just doing the compressions on a, a pulseless victim, significantly raise their survival rate. Um, so that's something that we always uh, encourage members of the community to partake in. Uh, in addition to that, we also do fire extinguisher training for any of the local businesses. Again, please contact the station. The folks are more than happy to come out and provide that fire extinguisher training for any of the businesses. Uh, another significant event that we did have earlier this year was the hot air balloon uh, crash that occurred just south of town where the hot air balloon actually came in contact with some power lines. Um, did result in some significant injuries to uh, some of the riders on the hot air balloon. Uh, again, both uh, the engine, the truck from Yauntville Station, as well as the local battalion chief responded to that incident. Uh, again, also with training being the uh, cornerstone of the fire service is the training that the folks at Yauntville Station provide to our county uh, volunteer recruit academy that happens every year. That's about a, 
a six month training, a combination of weekends and weeknights. And again, uh, the folks from Yauntville Station are very active in that, not only teaching fire behavior, but also doing live fire training burns so that the firefighters, when they do graduate, they've been quote unquote battle tested and, and have that live fire experience. Another picture of the graduation. And that is it. And at this point, I'd be happy to answer any, answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Are there any questions of the council? No, but thank you so much for Thank you. I yeah, appreciate you. Uh, I'm sure you enjoy giving the presentations now. Uh, I do. Um, it, it's a good excuse for me to get out of the office and, and get up and, and see the communities that we do serve. Um, as you all know, with a hectic schedule, it's easy to sometimes get locked into the day to day, but I welcome the opportunity to come out and see the community that we help protect. It's too bad we don't have our uh, deputy quarterly report here from the sheriff's department. We like to see the inter interaction, I would say. Uh, Sergeant Hallman's a great person. I've known him for a long time as well as his right. dad. Um, but I'm heading out to a national night out uh, right now, to, and I'm sure I'll, I'll see some of uh, his coworkers down there. So I'll make sure to give him a bad time for not making it tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. You can much. always count on Cal Fire to do that. Yeah. Give them a hard time. <laughs> it goes both ways. Yeah, I good. know. Thank you. We have no public hearings this uh, evening, so we'll move right at, on to our items under administrative regular items. Item 10A is the town's response to the Napa County Grand Jury Report. And uh, I will invite our town manager to yep. start off. <clears throat> Mayor and Council, um, <clears throat> as you may, well, as you all are aware, the grand jury did a review of all of the municipal water public works departments that are providing water service and <clears throat> focusing on taste and odor, which is really a very small subset of what is actually um, tested. And they came to a series of results um, that basically said, um, <clears throat> that taste and order should be perhaps getting more attention and they made a series of findings and our recommendations. Mm -hmm. We have a very detailed staff report so I'm going to kind of leave it to you as to how how detailed or response you want mm -hmm. but town staff has put together a response to all of the findings. I do want to point out that there's a very unique situation in this particular case I think a, a major oversight in how the grand jury presented its case and findings, which is that the town is not the owner and operator of Rector Reservoir and the treatment plant. So a number of the things and the statements they're making are not in the actual jurisdictional control of the town of Yountville. We are a wholesale water customer who purchases our water. So nonetheless, by law, we are required to present a copy of the draft response um, the grand jury indicated that they would like to see a little more transparency um, in certain types of policies. Um, in this particular case, we actually do have a process in place for complaints. It also includes forms when you call in processing. We also on our MyVille app have a water quality complaint component that people can use on the MyVille app. So if you have any questions about the response, we do need to have council direction to comply and return the response. If you have questions about the proposed response or things happy to answer, Gary and I have reviewed this and we've worked with the public work staff. Um, again, I do want to assure everybody, the one thing that the findings of the grand jury that we wholeheartedly agree on is that the overall water quality of the Napa Valley and all of the jurisdictions met and exceeded state and federal water quality standards. So the issue here is really every once in a while there may be an issue of turbidity or odor and that does not have anything necessarily to do with water quality and, and safety. So I just kind of want to make sure that everybody in the audience understands the, the focus and that all of the public agencies are delivering water that meets or exceeds the requirements of federal law. Right, thank you, and it is a very thorough report. Um, I would just ask you to summarize a, a little bit more, even just to say there are some things that we agreed with the grand jury's uh, evaluation have already implemented 
either fixes or confirmation of things in place. There's nowhere in here that there is something that's either not working correctly or insufficient uh, that we are, as you said, meeting or exceeding all um, either operational requirements or water quality. Correct. Okay. Gary, did you have anything more you wanted to add or are you good? All good. Yeah, the responses are pretty well dictated in the penal code that authorizes the grand jury to look into it. So these responses are as required by statute, but expanding on those and providing additional information is something the town can do as well. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the council? No? Any member of the audience have a question or a comment on this? Seeing none, uh, the action we are being asked to take. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Okay, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Um, so I would, before we take a motion, uh, I would like to suggest that we add a summary paragraph at the beginning, really succinctly stating our unique position, that I know we say that in the findings, um, but one of the first things I did when I moved to Napa was I was selected to serve on a grand jury, so I know when these come in, if we can telegraph to them, these are our unique circumstances, that is sometimes helpful on the go forward. So some type of executive summary explaining the relationship that we have with the Department of Veterans Affairs would certainly be appropriate, I think. If that's the consensus of the council, happy to add that, and that's not at all a problem. We, we kind of weave that through, so putting it into a, a more succinct point up front is not a, not a problem. Is there a consensus from the council that that addition is? Yes. Okay, so uh, with that, is there a motion to um, accept the response with the addition of an executive summary? If so, please <coughs> do so. So moved, but I don't have the button. Let's just go ahead. Okay, so we have a motion by the vice mayor. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 That passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Yes, it is a 5-0 vote. Okay, next up we have a uh, follow-up to our previously held parking workshop. Uh, town manager is going to uh, start off this conversation. Um, thank you, Mayor Council. I'd also like to um, start off by sharing that what we have presented is sort of a work plan that we're proposing and asking for council feedback. There may be some elements that you don't want us to do. There may be some elements that need follow-up and we will be coming back to you in order to implement. And there may be some things that you want to modify or encourage us to add. But what we tried to do was take the feedback and the information from the conversation that council had during the workshop. So I also want to stress that this is not a take it or leave it, this is a menu. And that's why I want to say that. There may be something that you provide some direction. Um, and in many cases, we will be following back. So um, I don't know, Michelle, Eddie, can we be ready with the um, PowerPoint visuals to help? Okay. Thank you. One of the key themes we had was, and it's a consistent council policy, is to maximize use of our um, own public right away. So one of the first themes is to recover and restore um, parking in the existing town public right away, and that's not the right. <laughs> Do you want me to keep going? What, what would you like? It should be, there we go. Yeah. So oh. the first theme is to um, look at, and locations that we've identified include public right away at Ponches and Chichios on the along the West Washington side of the street. We've also identified additional parking that could be recovered on the one-way segment on adjacent of Jefferson Street adjacent to Vandalier Park. Are you wanting me to, you have to tell me because oh, it's I'm not sorry, my yes. presentation, yep. so. Okay, they're not following up in the order. So the there should one. be. It's Vandalier. There we go. So there's a one-way segment there and the concept would be to allow parking on both. Uh, that especially has the potential of freeing up some of the concern about employee parking from the French Laundry on Jefferson. Um, and then, now we can go back to the community center 
Uh, we've also, looking at this design and realizing that we may be able to redesign this <coughs> for uh, more uh, potentially more parking in a different format. And then the last areas that came out of council feedback was to take a look at evaluate Creek Street to see whether um, the parking management and the loading zones. So that's one prong that we call recover and restore parking in the existing right of way. So I'll kind of stop there to see if you have any feedback or thoughts on what we have put put into that concept. Uh, questions from Council Councilor Durham. Question. So on. <coughs> so on Van. On Vandalier, the idea is parking on both sides of the street. Correct. And that section, it's on Jefferson. That's Correct. that's a one-way section of Jefferson. Correct. I just want to make sure. Then it'll all be teed off. Correct. What I would say, and actually, uh, Council Member Durham, that's a good point. All of these involve formalizing and putting parking tees in where if they don't exist, so that we are making it really, really clear that it is a parking area. Very good. Thank you. That's it for the moment. Okay. Question to Council Member Muller. Um, there are businesses in that um, area, and they're not. Uh, always part of our business plan. I mean, our, our parking plan is, uh, you know, like French laundry and things like that. I'm trying to get a sense of, do we have any idea of uh, the number of ideal parking places if we could just, you know, say, we'll take 20 more. You know, how much are we really uh, going to get out of, um, you know, Old Town away from a lot of the neighbors where we're having complaints? Well, Do we have any sense of that number? No, I'm not going to try to tell you I have an exact number of the French Laundry employees working on a shift. But what I can tell you is we will shift, no pun intended, 10 additional vehicles into that area impacting the park. So I think it's a positive from that standpoint. Is there any way we can get some sense of how many um, employees per shift we would ideally like to get, you know, relocated? I, I don't have that you information don't, from you the. You don't have. So, so we don't have any parking plan at all with. with the, the French Laundry is a 25 plus year grandfathered okay, so restaurant it's, operation. It's the answer okay. is no. I don't have any information other than the okay, obvious. Thanks. Any other questions? We have more report to go, but just so far, uh, Vice I'm just Mayor. Thank you. And on uh, the, the proposed spaces on, along Vandalure Park, that does not take out any park space, right? No, it comes to the edge of the park, but it does not take out park. And there's sufficient access, things like fire uh, vehicles have plenty of space there because it's one way on that one. Correct. Segment. We'll reevaluate everything with one last final engineering plan and make the mock-up of where the T's are. The, the one thing that we may need to do is a, um, a fog line striping on both sides so that people are really clear because one of the issues on the existing parking is because the street only has parking on one side. Some people don't go as far um, off of the, the center line as they should. So you know we'll make sure that it's marked, identified. You have gravel on, on the east side. And a portion of it is a paved, so the tees will be on the, the paved side there as well to, to maximize. Yeah, other questions? Yeah, Councilor Just Durham. to clarify one point, the parking at Ponchas and then therefore Chicho's is already there. It's just formalizing. This is formalizing it. We made some movements about a couple of years ago, and the right-of-way at one point was not wide enough to allow safely parking. Uh, and this does allow for the parking return, so we will communicate, if this is the direction you give, we'll communicate with the two businesses, and then we will move forward with implementing, I, I think we identified six or seven spaces that will go into that location. So, so again, I would say there's no silver bullet, but I think there's incremental little things that we can do in different nodes of the community that increase parking supply. Other questions so far? Yes, Councilmember Dornbecker. I guess I don't see where the community center parking um, alterations are going to be. They're under discussion. That's the very so front where we have, oh, we, we think we may spot. be able to do some angled parking, and currently it has sort of a um, ADA parking, and it's just 
from an engineering standpoint, it may not be the best use of that real estate since we have considerable ADA parking along the side. So right now I'm not gonna guarantee you that it is anything, but again, following the theme of where might there be pavement to recover and increase parking, we wanna put it on. We heard it on the discussion list, so we think it, it deserves a little further evaluation. I did have an additional question about the post office parking. It seems to me that um, there are, it's very rare that those uh, spots are being used. Is it because we have, we have to allot those spots for the post office? Is that what's that going is on? That's actually correct. I see. The town leases, the town owns the post office building and is part of the lease agreement. I see. Um, that is the minimum number of parking spaces. So, and the post office is very protective of their lease. So. The challenge that I would say with a post office parking, it's like any parking situation in town. You can drive by a number of times and not see an issue, and you can drive by another time and see all of the spaces filled, but they're not filled long term. And because of the nature of the um, community boxes, the PO boxes, that's what, so you, you're in the daytime, but they're not all fully utilized generally all the time, but no. they, they could be at a point in time. Just to follow up on that, I think we should uh, look into timing that instead of saying uh, post office only. Uh, I, have, I don't think I've ever seen every single one of those parking spots taken you're, up for the post office. You're moving ahead to the next item, but I'll make a note of adding that. Well, Councilmember Dornbecker started it, so <laughs> <laughs> that's all I can say. <laughs> all right. Um, so do you want to get through the entire thing before we go to public comment or shall I ask any members of the public if they'd like to? It, your preference on how you want to do well, it. Councilor Durham? I thought we were just talking about the first recover we're, and restore because then I've Yeah, we haven't gotten better. through the entire thing yet. So okay. <laughs> we're going incrementally. I think I'm going to wait until we get through all of it to invite members of the public to participate. Thank you. <clears throat> Another area that we heard that came out of a request from the NOYO business community was to look at implementing a three hour parking demonstration project in the area of the parking that would include, uh, now we can go to the three hour slide, the area of, um, there we go. So it would include the area in front of Jessup, Stewart, Ponches and Chichios, and then it would include on Jackson, the area right adjacent to the playground equipment at the park, and then the area along Veterans Memorial Park. The thought process here is that it allows for turnover and, and employees aren't parking in areas where we necessarily want the residents <coughs> and uh, visitors to be able to access. So this would be really our first effort into a more uh, structured timing parking enforcement. Um, three hours is recommended because for most of the businesses, it allows the person to complete the taste, have a meal, and most activities at the parks, with the exception of special events, don't generally exceed a three hour duration. And again, this was there was quite a lot of um, business support for, for trying this in the NOYO area. So two pieces of feedback. If the council is interested in this, we will need to go back to the Parks and Rec Advisory Commission to share because several of these things impact, we think in a positive way, the parks, but we have a transparency policy of making sure that the items that infect the various parks would go back to the Advisory Commission. Okay, Steve, hold on a sec. Councilor Dornbecker, question. Yes, um, my, my question is if we do begin the three-hour parking, what is the trade-off in terms of um, policing that and, and uh, you know, ticketing and everything? Is that something that is going to add to the budget or what is going to happen there? Part of this, um, uh, Council Member, is actually a, a pilot project for us to get a better understanding. Um, I'm going to be very honest. We're going, this is like tipping your toe into a more aggressive enforcement, um, it will have cost. You know, staff will also be trained to support the deputies in the appropriate way to do the citation process and management um, because 
it, it now requires use of technology, pictures and documentation. The old fashioned chalking tires and coming back is not legal in California. So I don't wanna be naive. What we anticipate doing would be um, periodic enforcement, you know, at different times in different locations during the day to see who and how. Um, and then I'm actually, will be in a broader discussions with the sheriff's department about what a, a more traditional CSO program might look like if we, if we need, uh, you know, a year from now determine that more parking enforcement and management support is necessary. But right now it would be done within our existing budget constraints. Other questions of this section? Councilmember Durham? Um, I'm sure all my parking ticket fees stayed in the town, so I'm happy to help. Actually, oh, they, they don't. Yes, I know. It was facetious more than anything. Um, one question about the three hours at um, Veterans Park. Where will those employees, where will those people go is my concern. The other side of the street and farther down along Washington where they're supposed to. Very good. And then, then, that, then it works. Good. <coughs> good. And there if has you, been recent addition to Champaign Drive with some uh, specific it, parking. I'm as just well. saying, it, for those of you that may be familiar with the area, you will find that oftentimes the understanding, again, this was very early preliminary before we implemented the full employee parking management plan. Hotel Yountville has to, um, and I'm going to be wrong, but I'm sorry, eight to 10 our management employees are parked on the north lot. We modified Champagne Drive, as you mentioned, to allow. And then there's an understanding that their employees are supposed to park on the hotel side, um, including the additional parking south of Champagne. So for those of you that frequent that area, you'll often know that there seems to be a tendency to park generally on closest to California, both sides, not on the hotel side and not on the side adjacent to the Hopper Creek apartments, all of which are within a one block. So this will be, I think, an opportunity to start looking at, um, again, in appropriate areas, how do we start looking at the employee behavior in looking at are some of these steps the right thing for us to be doing to potentially modify um, poor employee behavior that's negatively. And that's why we're trying them in you know, three different locations with three different impacts. And we still need to define the required, legally required signage that would go to any limited, time limited, whether it's signage, whether it's curb uh, painting, both. You need both. So I'm not, anybody that in order for us to cite somebody there needs to be uh, the, the guidance we're going off of is the minimum amount of signage necessary but the driver needs to be able to have an awareness that the zone they're parking in is subject to time restriction and it's generally been found that just simply painting the curb a color and putting you know 20 minutes three hours is not sufficient you need both actually you can do just the signs but if you do the curb paintings you need to do both Okay, next section. All right, a follow up to that based on some resident input was that we consider and implement a ban on limo and bus parking on residential streets. The area we're looking at here is principally in the Old Town area, um, Jefferson, Padroni, um, Starkey would be where we would recommend e evaluating and starting and then it could be uh, as a pilot program to see how effective. We're also anticipating that the signs would include bus limo parking available at Yountville Community Park so that not only are we just telling them no, but we're also letting them know where they can go to park. Any questions about that? Okay. The next theme came out of is a respect our neighbors theme. And that would be signage that is installed in the areas where we have the transition nodes between the neighborhoods, commercial and residential. You may recall that a few years ago, we had a couple signs here at the um, Humboldt 
and um, Yount. So in this particular case, we'd be looking at reactivating something like that. A limited number of signs where they would be uh, two-sided, but along the initial entry point so that a, a employee walking back to their car would be reminded to be respectful of their neighbors that they're in a residential zone. I have a comment. Okay, I do. Um, given our discussion and our concerns about, uh, in the past, about signage and continued signage and now three hour signage and now signage for entering the neighborhoods, um, my input is to wait on these because if the others can work and be implemented, then this should be alleviated quite a bit um, with a lot of those problems. Everything's not gonna happen overnight. A lot, as you show in this report, some things are gonna happen um, a little slower than the other things that can be happened immediately. And I, I, my comment is to put this one into the longer term so that we can see how the other ones work out first. So we do not become Yonfield Town of Signs. Okay. I have questions. Um, yeah, we're we're gonna hold off, I think, uh, more comment as we get through the whole thing, but um, I think we want to get through the entire report, then we can ask questions on each section so we don't forget any, then we can get a little more thorough conversation. Because as Steve's presenting, this is not an all or nothing yeah. at all. And if we agree that we want to implement some of this, then we may not want to implement others. So, Councilmember Muller, question? Well, one of the things that just kind of uh, brings to mind all, all this discussion, uh, um, we'll see where we end up doing and not doing is really you know educating our own community and the way i really want to educate them not that we're only doing this but i can just hear now that yonville's trying to make money issuing parking tickets and uh maybe we can have our town attorney actually give us, give us a quick where that money really goes it does not stay here it's actually going to cost us money is isn't that Correct, because yes. I think, uh, you know, as we roll out the education of this, that uh, I really want to make that clear because I think it's important. And, you know, it, it's going to be a misconception about this whole idea. Yeah, and I'm happy to expand on that. There's a division between it, between the state and the county and the courts, and there's a complicated schedule of how it's divided up. M much of it does not stay here in the town, and all the enforcement costs do. So that is true. So we're not doing this to make money. Is it no, I think, and I would also point out if you look at the areas, I mean, and we've moved off the three-hour parking, right? But it, you know, that's not a very large part of town. So we're trying to look at nodes to better understand. We also need to educate ourselves. The environment is changing, and we need to we need to fully understand what does it look like to address the issues that are of concern to the council and the community. So we've got to be willing to go look at and get a better understanding of what that, but no, this is not about making money. If I wanted to make money, I would be recommending putting parking meters mm -hmm. in all of downtown parking spots. Thank so you. I just want to be really You're clear. not doing yeah. that. And I want to. I heard the moans from the audience, <laughs> really Steve. Clear I just too. want to be real honest. It's this not on not here and it's not a recommendation, but if it was all about money, that's what we'd be doing. <coughs> Any all other right. questions of this section? Nope, okay. The last one is one we briefed you on that we're starting, and um, staff is working along with the staff of NVTA, and the, the goal is to come up with designated rideshare drop-off zones within Washington Street. Some of them may be sharing an existing bus stop. Some may be us taking a parking spot and making it a drop-off location. One of the challenges we're finding is that um, again, this is, you know, some of our friendly out-of-town Uber and Lyft drivers just stop in the middle of the street and stop traffic. So we're getting some congestion and, and very unsafe moves on the part of the drivers because somebody could rear-end them suddenly or something like that. So uh, we're also, the Chamber is interested and supportive of this. The idea would be that we come up with a program, um, map it, identify it, also share it with Uber and Lyft so that they can put it as part of the communications for drivers. And then there would be um, more significant enforcement of 
Uber and Lyft drivers that fail to follow the guidelines for um, working in Yountville, if you were. Okay. I think when we get to that conversation a little more thoroughly, let's uh, circle back to the space in front of the community center that's currently uh, specific to of, ADA yep. accessibility. It's in the center of town near a lot of businesses. Um, uh, that might be somewhere it's, it's going to naturally be yep. a drop-off pickup location. So It's on that list of why we say we think we can do something different there. Okay. And again, we'll be coming back. You know, there'll be a, a public workshop with everybody once we have a discussion point of what this might all look like. Okay, next. All right. The next four are a little more evolved and will not happen uh, right away, um, but they involve, based on the conversation, establishing several working groups. Um, staff is recommending uh, four right now uh, because they have a, a finite purpose and a narrow range, but the council could choose to take a different approach on how they want it to do. One of the themes that came out is that signage is inadequate in a number of areas. One, uh, the comment was that the signs that the town allows for businesses to put on their property to identify that they have a rear parking lot, whatever we're doing is not working because people seem to be missing the rear parking lots. And it's either too understated or when a business comes in and does it, they do it in a way that You've, you've gone by the business before, so it's not working. The secondary theme also was, could we do a better job of identifying where public parking is? So again, the thought here was, part of this is looking at the business community language and our particular codes, you know, planning. So again, a very kind of uh, specific nature. The the second requested working committee came out of council direction and more of a question also, which is how do we better utilize what at times looks like underutilized capacity at Yountville Community Center? There are a number of times when the, we have events and activities and it's full, but is there a way to do something with that parking um, differently in areas? So that is something that um, there's a couple of businesses that may be more impacted, community center staff town. The other um, working group came out of the NOYO request, which is to increase parking supply by looking at um, potential construction in the existing right of way for improving parking. So that would be to look at a public private public private public excuse me public private partnership, three P's. Um, working group to look at what might that look like. So, and then the other thing that I'm sharing with you, and I don't know that we necessarily need a committee right now, would be identifying perhaps a longer term relationship with the Seventh day Adventist Church about potential use in Midtown um, if the town was to lease part of their parking and add that to some of the employee parking supply for Midtown. So, well, those are the working groups and then the last two areas that are longer term and more significant is actually the construction of parking enhancement whether that's parking in the um, north washington right away as a result of coming to some understanding of the public private partnership or the um, south of the veterans memorial and again these are different nodes and they serve different target op um, opportunities and the one thing that you often hear the story you know all politics are local well all parking is local and th the reason I share that some of these have a distinct focus is that the NOYO discussion is going to be of significant interest to the businesses in NOYO but not necessarily to the business community on the south end of town even though increasing the overall parking supply and awareness in some of our programs may overlap. But again, if the council wants one working group, that's your option. But I think the thing there is you need to realize those are the themes that we took out of your conversation. So we were hoping that these would not be long-term working groups, but that they would meet a couple of times, come up with a recommendation that's appropriate, <clears throat> and, you know, and they would work 
based on the duration of what the nature of the assignment is. So with that, that's the staff's report and recommendations. We're certainly happy to um, hear your feedback, thoughts, and direction, or if there's things that you don't want to do, or some things that you would like to see on the list that aren't. Okay, thank you. I know, and that's a whole lot of stuff, and we're going to try to figure out how to prioritize it or scale it back. I do want to invite anyone that's sitting here that's just heard all that. If anybody wants to uh, ask questions or provide a comment on on the staff report before we continue the conversation, anyone out there? Yes, please, Jake. Just uh, got a couple of thoughts. Uh, if you could just identify yourself for our record, please. Sorry, by name. If you just oh, offer your name, Jake Costa. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Just a couple of thoughts that might be a possible easier answer is maybe this has been addressed is a, a very attractive employee carpooling arrangement uh, with with the businesses in town that would free up a lot of the spaces and instead of going through a lot of hoops the uh, I don't know if that's been approached at all but make it very very attractive for the employers in this town to have carpooling for their employees. And I'm thinking that could be even such a, a small scale, such as the north part of town, if there's parking available at the park there, and then the south side of town, if beyond Veterans Park, if there's some public space there. And that could be a carpooling arrangement on a small scale, just feeding those two into the businesses. Um, my other thought is an employee shuttle that would certainly free up a lot of the space in town for our residents and our visitors without going through a lot of signage and um, something that would be, you know, gas-powered, 15-passenger uh, that would shuttle during the peak times of employees, which I think you probably find is the case, like probably 7 a.m. and 3 p.m. and those types of shifts. So just a couple ideas that could be viable options. Thank you. Thank you. And, and just uh, for information, at the countywide level, uh, there is an effort, uh, especially through the Napa Valley Transportation Authority, uh, it's really been spearheaded by Supervisor Pedroza to bring in countywide carpooling and identifying some of the largest employers throughout the valley and bringing them together because with the very small number of employees, it's not cost effective at all for them to pay for those types of organized services, but at a bigger scale, the hope is that employers will will help support that and help us get employees around, not just in Yonville, but throughout the Valley, potentially keep them out of cars from the very beginning uh, and so we don't have to worry about them parking here. So just so you're aware of that effort on a little bit broader countywide level. Um, any other comments or questions from the public? Okay, let's continue discussion. We are trying to prioritize what um, staff has presented. Um, I personally feel like there are some things that we can uh, look at immediately and any of these things that we implement, I think we need to give time to actually see what the impacts are. Uh, but does anyone want to start with some recommendations? I kind of feel like Council Member Durham is, is Council Member Parking only because the public made me that, which I'm happy to take on. So Vandalier Park, I think, can be done um, relatively soon, and I'm completely in support of. The three-hour parking at all three locations, I think, can be re done relatively soon, and I'm completely in support of. Um, the limo bus ban um, in the residential, I'm c definitely in support of. Uh, the residential signage, I'd like to hold off and see how the other... Um, items that we're implementing come into play before we add more more signage to the residential um, community. The ride share, um, I'm open to, but not at the expense of any parking. I, I don't think it's worth it to have a space, have, I think it defeats the purpose to remove a parking space to allow someone to drop off. Uh, most of, a, as I think about it, obviously none of the hotels are gonna have issues with it. Um, 
The issue becomes when someone pulls up to Bistro Gentil, the Uber driver passes it and stops immediately because there's no place to stop. Same thing with Bouchon. Um, I've seen tour buses with 50 people stop in front of Bouchon and allow everybody to get off of it. So um, I, I'm all for it, but just not at the expense of removing another parking space. Um, lastly, to establish a North Washington Street right away, I'm my whole discussion and a lot of my discussion at the office hours has been, and it seems to be some like-minded thoughts from my community members as well, is that, which I have said all along, is we have an employee parking problem. Um, the employees park there longer. Um, they're not as respectful. They're leaving at 1, 2 a.m. in the morning, whereas if it's a guest coming to this community, 90% um, of them will not be leaving at uh, two in the morning. Um, they uh, tend to be a little bit more respectful of the community. Um, so therefore, I think it's very important that a lot of this come from the perspective of how do we deal with the employee parking in this community. As just to reiterate to the community, maybe half of the businesses, probably not half, but I'm guessing here, are part of the employee parking management plan, which I think the town is doing a good job moving forward with the issue is is, a, is the other half is not so we can't dictate to everybody we can't we can't monitor everyone so with that being said i think that the north washington street right away um is a high priority i know it's going to take longer but it is definitely a high priority and it's something that i want to uh, volunteer to participate with as well so thank you any specific thoughts about the proposed working group ideas um, I was, I'll, I'll admit, um, careful what you asked for because I asked for the workshop and then we got this. Um, and I thought it was, um, I, I, at first I thought it should all be under one umbrella. What I do, thanks for pointing that out. What I do want to point out is after talking to staff, I understand where they're coming from, but I really, really want to make sure that this doesn't become four separate working groups. You know. I, I want to make sure this is a town-wide issue. Like you said, it's all local. Um, it's not where uh, do we put French Laundry employees because if French Laundry employees get pushed out, they're going to be parking further down here, which is going to affect everybody. And it's going to continue to happen as West, um, with West America Bank, with Red reopening um, sometime, and with the French Laundry potentially having some sort of development. I'm not saying this year or next year, but potentially. Um, so all of those things are going to impact this whole community. So I just want to make sure that even though we have the four workshops, we all realize, no matter who's participating with what, that we still need to be in constant communication with each other to realize how is this going to uh, impact the community. Because it's not just the Marina District over here and the Mission District over there. So. I'm fine with all four. Thank you. Who would like to go next? Councilmember Muller. I'll give it a shot. Uh, I, I think it was uh, a very, I kind of wasn't really looking forward to a parking workshop, but uh, I w was really surprised how um, I think comprehensive and useful and uh, thoughtful that staff really put everything together. Um, I do think uh, I agree that uh, you know recovering parking in the right of way should be a priority. That seems like something we have total control over, and adding more spots makes uh, a lot of sense. I'm also uh, the three-hour parking uh, trial in North Washington. I think that's kind of a, a no-brainer. I do consider that a trial and a pilot. I really want to see um, it enforced but then I want to see what the consequences of that enforcement are. So, you know, mm -hmm. how do the scales end up tipping there? But uh, if we're going to say three hours, uh, we need to be serious about it, and people need to get tickets. Otherwise, it, it's a waste of time. So, but I'm willing to consider that a trial. Um, the signs are the ones that um, I know we got to have signs, and we're, we're a town that doesn't like to have signs. So um, I'm, I don't want to be on that uh, group to have to figure that out. I guess that's the only thing I can tell you right, right now. It's, uh, it's, you know, 
it's going to be uh, very difficult. I'm um, also interested in the uh, community center parking. I Right now, um, I don't think it's one of our, our highest priorities just because of the location of the businesses and the, and the issues that we're seeing. What we're hearing from the residents is the major issue right now uh, that we have is in uh, the Old Town area. Um, so I think some of these things, so even though residents might think, well, you never talked about us, you're not doing anything, I think that we really are by doing some of these peripheral activities that will hopefully contribute to that. So I, I would like to somehow figure out a way to really monitor that, like how many cars are on the streets now, and if we do some of these uh, nearby uh, activities, are there going to be less cars or we're going to have the same amount of cars? So are we just going to wait for the citizens to complain? I think if we could get some kind of a monitoring system for that, you, I'm not talking every day, maybe you just do it uh, you know, the first Friday of every month or something like that so we can really see, do we, do we see changes? So um, in terms of all these working groups, it sure seems like a lot. I do like the idea that um, the chamber is going to be involved because we are talking about the businesses here. So I think that's a great idea. Uh, community center, I think uh, I'm willing to let that wait a little bit. Um, North Washington, I think that's a, an easy one. Um, I suppose the three hours involved in that, so I'd be happy to help there. And those are kind of my priorities right now. I saw some of the Humboldt signs, respect your neighbor. Uh, I was walking late at night and there was a car with the radio going, smoking cigarettes, throwing it out the window. So right in front of the sign. I, I don't know. Maybe the town has better information than I do about whether that worked. Uh, it was just kind of an ironic scene to me as it turned out. So those are my thoughts. Okay, thank you. Councilman Jordan Becker. Well, I agree with Council Member Durham that I don't want to see ride uh, sharing places take the place of parking spots um, on Washington Street. I just, I, you know, I don't know what we can do except if we could have them stop only at the bus stops, that would be my preference. Um, I think the north side of town, North Washington Street, that's that's a major, I think that's one of the major problem areas because it borders on Old Town. So I think that definitely to have the uh, public-private partnership working group is a good idea. Um, I, I actually am wondering why um, just south of the bocce courts in Veterans Park, we don't direct um, some of the employee parking to that location because um, you know the, the it's it's just a sort of a dirt lot but well, why not if I can remind the council that's a, a good question council member Dornbecker the town had entered into an agreement with the prior ownership of Hotel Yountville and it is something we may look at. It may be something that the business community along the south end of town has an interest. Um, currently, that is the overflow of parking. And what you're finding is the employees are not using any of the parking south of Champaign for the most part. <clears throat> I won't say never because never is not a good word to use, but they're not using it the way we had anticipated because that is the overflow zone for the Hotel Yountville operations. I think that it may offer an opportunity to look at uh, the ownership of Ad Hoc and Red. They, they may be of benefit to revisiting how we might have a public-private partnership on the south end of town. Um, that is a logical two-block wa two walk, so it's doable. I mean, most of us that have lived in a more urban area would welcome a two block walk to our employer from a safe, secure, obvious parking area. So I think you know we need to put 
the same way the council has looked at both of these. There's, if you may recall, you have seen concepts on both of these because as council member Durham says, we love to talk about parking. So some of these concepts are not really new. It's a question of the tipping point reaching to where is this the time to start doing some of them. Well, and my, my last thought is, and I hope you'll uh, forgive the question, I was away and missed the parking workshop and I was wondering what was the participation on the part of um, residents where there are a lot of residents that attended? Yes, I would say we had a, a, almost an equal number of uh, residents and um, business representatives. Well, just Mostly from the north end of town, mm -hmm. businesses, I mean. Thank you. Probably 40 to 50 people. Mm -hmm. well, that is healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you, and um, thank you, Town Manager and staff. It is, was an excellent staff report and uh, presentation, so thanks. I'm just kind of going to go through, uh, I think I'm in general agreement with most of what uh, my fellow council members have said. I'm in favor of the recover and restore pieces, which I'm assuming is the North Washington right away that Council Member Durham referenced. Um, I'm in favor of the three hour, also echoing what uh, Council Member Moeller said about the enforcement. Um, same with the, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm in favor of the limo and bus restrictions. Um, also, I'm with the, the general consensus so far, I think, of the good neighbor signs. I would not put those in now. Um, I would not do the ride share now because it is the expense uh, of parking places. And also, I don't think we have a mechanism if someone doesn't use the ride share. I know we will educate our businesses, but if, if someone doesn't use the ride share and they stop somewhere else, um, I don't know that the ride share really helps since it's at the expense of parking spaces and I would let other things play out to see how it works. Um, I'm in favor of, go of staff going ahead and pursuing uh, something with the Seventh-day Adventist lot. I think that could be a really good win-win uh, for folks. Um, working groups, I had the same question apparently uh, other council members had, and that is why so many. I'm kind of open to suggestion on that. I see the need for the subject matter areas. Um, I think we'll probably discuss further tonight whether that's four separate groups or ever how many groups it is, and I'm, of course, happy to participate as desired in those. Um, the construction of parking enhancements, I would put that on the back burner until we see how some of other the, some of these other things work unless an opportunity happens to present itself to us. Oh, and one thing I think um, town manager asked of what we would like to see um, that is not on the list, and that is I would like to see um, whether our town attorney, I know that we have the way our um, conditional use permits are set up and who, when you can and can't get into or have to get into an employee parking management program. I know the nexus issues, but I'd like to see uh, from the town attorney and staff's point of view if there is a way to bring some businesses in at this time um, and not do violence to, to what we already have on the books. As far as the signage goes, I am very sensitive to signage and I would like to keep that at a minimum but still um, do what we need to have done. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just uh, yeah, Councilmember Moeller. ask a question? I, I want a little more, um, you mentioned the word uh, parking enhancement. Did I miss something? What does that mean? That I wrote down what the town manager said, construction of parking enhancements, which I am assuming he means um, up by the park on the north and the uh, lot south of the bocce courts. That was my assumption of what he meant by that. So it was, the word was construction. Tees no, I think street. it's lots. I think it's paving. We're doing tees and enhancements. The specifics we're talking about that are longer term is the construction of parking in the North Washington right away and the lot. And again, 
none of these are new to the council. You've seen different variations and concepts on those over the last eight to 10 years. So the question, and in fact, your CIP actually has some evaluation of design options for North Washington. Let's be more specific, Steve. Where exactly? Are we talking about along the gravel slope next to the west side of Yonkla right. Community Madison, Park? Madison, Madison okay. to Jackson. So let's not assume that the whole audience yep. knows uh, the exact locations. We're also talking about the triangular lot across from the Catholic Church at the very south end of town. Correct. That's currently a dirt lot. That's in addition to the proposed T's being added right. in places like okay. in front of Chicho and Poncha's uh, Vandalier Park on the one-way part of Jefferson, potentially on Creek Street on the north side only, those types of things. Okay, so I definitely want to, if I didn't say before, I definitely want to throw my support in for the Vandalier uh, Park parking. So just so I'm clear, when we talk about parking enhancement, I don't mean to be dense here, but so we're talking about probably the angle parking across on the east side of the park, uh, the community park, and I think there may be. Or is, is parking enhancement kind of a, a general term? It, it's, using? So it's a. I'll, I'll answer it. It's All a right. general term. Okay. It includes different things. Okay. We're, we don't need to look at that. Um, okay. Because those aerials are even. They're not even all current. But um, there are some places that we have looked at potentially doing angled parking. Right. like on the east side of Yonfo right. Community Park, okay. it's now parallel parking, that would potentially mean that would become a one-way street right. that could add parking all the way around the park. There's also the gravel lot on the west side opposite Knapp Valley Lodge that could be built up to be an asphalt level area where currently it's so sloped you can't safely park there. But we also have to recognize with all that comes Signage, lighting, safety elements, whether it's crosswalks and things. So it's not those types of enhancements would not be as simple or as would certainly be more expensive because other elements would need to go with them, not just okay. striping T's on an existing street. Okay. Projects are distinctly different than the recover and expand parking in the existing right of way. So I'm going to jump in on some things. <coughs> um, and now, the very last point, Vice Mayor, that you made, I was going to start with because I didn't want to forget, and I forgot. Uh, the construction of parking enhancements. Parking enhancements. No, it and wasn't that one. <laughs> oh, now you've broken your microphone. No, I think you need some enhancements. That's right, I do. I need enhancements. No, you had oh. talked about the ride share, um, um, and there was something else. Oh, and the town attorney and staff looking into, is there a way to capture businesses in the employee management? Yes, thank you. So I wanted to start there because I feel like we don't need to stay so narrowly focused on the parking management plan for employees. We saw with the support from the chamber and the, re the business representatives at the workshop that they're prepared to participate in some ways now. Uh, we don't need to dive into all of their conditional use permits and figure out how can we find something that's activating a new requirement for parking? They should be good neighbors and good business owners and voluntarily, frankly, participate. I think that should be our effort rather than, um, I think it just kind of um, makes a more complex solution that can be relatively straightforward. And, and if there is a lack of participation, then we go to, I think, the, the next layer of enforcement. Um, I think Councilmember Durham, you did a great job of listing uh, some of the elements that we really are um, can deal with right away. The stripes on Vandalier on the one-way section, yes. Three-hour parking. I worry about where they're going to go, uh, but we'll, we're hopefully putting a cumulative package together here. But three-hour parking, where it's been identified, um, certainly the limousine and bus. Uh, prohibition in the neighborhoods I would go beyond Old Town we've, we've tried to get them off of um, Mulberry and some of the other streets with the bulb outs the drivers learn that's not effective uh, what is effective is tickets and 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 the financial impact 
Um, I also hesitate to want to add more residential signage until we see what these effects are, um, because the beauty of Old Town, I think, is going to be too negatively impacted with <laughs> more signs. Uh, I disagree about the rideshare spaces uh, in the sense of I get about taking parking spaces away. I don't see it as taking them away. Uh, I think we can't, we can't ignore the fact that we have some professional drivers and some novice drivers that just stop wherever their client wants them to stop. We've already implemented laws that say you will be fined if you do that, okay, but we still see it every day. As you said, we see it not just in – the small individual private vehicles, but you see it in large passenger vehicles as well. Um, I think looking at center of town in front of the community center, there's virtually no excuse to not pull over to the curb if we find a replacement for those uh, ADA accessible mm -hmm. spaces there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how it could work with the bus stops. The concern there is if you have somebody that pulls over to pick up somebody or drop them off and the bus is coming, then where's the bus supposed to go? So I worry about using those spaces. Um, I support developing that west side of Yonville Community Park where it's now gravel and virtually unusable for parking and frankly unsafe for walking. Uh, but we also want to be um, sensitive to what that means i know we have the um, hotel on the west side of that as well and what that might mean visually uh, but what it might add to the ability to park up at a park i would also look at angled parking and revisit the one way uh, on lincoln that would allow um, more parking i know some of the residents up there i'm not sure we have some that live in that area here tonight um, we want to look at that with the sensitivity of uh, more cars, more headlights, um, but we have a significant impact of parking need now that we have developed the north end of town. There's no getting around that. Um, as I've said before in these conversations, we used to get complaints that we forgot about the north end of town. It's too sleepy. Nothing's going on. And now that's flipped 180 degrees. Um, Let's look at, and I don't know that this is an answer for anything, but the center turn lane, the north end of Washington, just south of Madison, is that the best use of that lane to have it there for truck delivery is basically what it turns into and left turn accessibility? Don't know. Just don't want to overlook an opportunity like that. Um, let's see. The other thing has also come up in previous conversations right here on Yon Street in front of the school. There's some question about the colored striping for the, the bus drop off and pick up. Uh, can that be striped differently? It already is. Okay. The, the signage is appropriate. The, so the all of that is developed as best as it can be developed. Correct, because right now the, the challenge there is why it's not utilized is that for long-term employee parking, they don't want to use it because the bus comes at certain spots and times and the signage says you can park there anytime but the times the bus is coming so that's i mean okay. it's just it okay. works for later but it does not work for midday uh we just visited uh the location of madison at washington slash lincoln and i feel like there is a very underutilized section of about what i would estimate six or seven spaces the north end of um Madison at Lincoln, right where we have curved the bus lane or the uh, bike lane. Um, it seems like it's, you know, granted that apartment building is empty right now, but it also has parking on the south side, on the Ma Madison side. I think we could capture uh, half a dozen spaces there if we striped it accordingly. Um, and those would be more efficiently used areas. I'm going to say no to working groups right now. I just, um, I, I can't imagine. Uh, I agree with Councilmember Durham about the separateness of the working groups. I don't think we can look at these individually. Uh, I think this is a collective effort that needs a collective analysis. Uh, but 
can we wait on the working groups until we implement some parking tees and some other things and see what the impacts are um, with the combination of all the ad hoc committees we have and the working groups and, and, and all of that, it gets to be overwhelming. Um, I brought up earlier, uh, there is an effort at the county level that is trying to address employee carpooling, shuttles. Um, the reality is people will not park at the ends of our town and work in the middle. They don't do it and they are not legally required to do it. We have forced it through some of our parking management plan for some businesses that can be um, cited if they don't. But let's recognize that a lot of the time it's not just our employees that are part of the problem. We now have, hold on Steve, we now have, I'm not gonna ask a show of hands of how many people park their car in their garage, for example, or how many cars people have for their residences, um, the state has said that we have to allow you to convert your garage to an apartment. That's a good thing for housing. It's not a good thing for parking. Um, and so we readily recognize that when there are two of us that live in a house, we have two, two cars, three cars, four cars, um, and that's part of the issue as well. And it's part of the issue in some areas, like Old Town, and it's not as big a part of the others because some of us, I'm way on the east side of town, so I'm not as impacted by the employees. But I know my neighbors that have multiple cars that are parked all over the street, um, but we don't have the combination of the two. It's the combination of the two where it's the employee parking and the um, higher volume of resident parking that becomes the trouble spots or the nodes, as you call them. So long-winded, but trying to keep us from having to go to another working group so I'm trying to get it all out right now. Um, I know we, you're asking for direction, um, maybe with a little bit more conversation, if you need clarity on the specific elements that we have some consensus on. Well, let me give you what I think I heard consensus on, and you can tell me if. So I basically heard consensus to move forward with the recover and restore parking. So clarify what you mean by that please, because there seemed to be a question even with the council on where exactly are you right, I'm going to read from the staff report. Please do. But it's recover and restore parking in the existing town public right-of-way at the following locations. North Washington Street adjacent to Ponches and Chichios and along West Washington Street on the eastern side, uh, excuse me, at Jefferson adjacent to Vandalier Park and to evaluate the existing and parking loading zones along Creek Street and on Washington Street in front of the Yountville Community Center. And you'll evaluate that. I'm asking to evaluate it both for uh, the most effective parking, but I'm also asking that we evaluate that for potential rideshare space if we can find ride shares on there. Got it. I'm just saying we've got the the whole rideshare mapping is still going to continue. I understand the council's preference to not see parking. So what you will see is something comes back that will show you and then if that's something you want to do. That's why it's a separate item, but we do we are very aware of the central location of Yountville Community Center. So the <clears throat> immediacy would be to move forward on Ponches and Chichios and Vandalier Park, have staff take a good look at Lincoln to see, excuse me, Creek Street to see if it's working. You asked us to look at that. That shouldn't take too long. And then we'll come up with some design concepts in front of Yountville Community Center. So that is what we call um, <clears throat> recover and restore because it's all existing right away. Okay. Three hour parking where? Three hour parking. Can we go back to the one map? Because I want to be really sure. I'll start with the south end of town. It would be South Washington on the west side adjacent to Veterans Memorial Park from California Drive to just approximately Champaign. The second area would basically be east side of North Washington from Starkey to Madison. So that would include in front of Jessup Stewart Sellers, south side 
Ponches and Chicho. All of that, a portion of that is angled parking. The portion in front of Ponches and Chicho would be parallel, but that whole section would be three hour parking. And then on the very north end of town, the portion of Jackson Street that is facing the playground and the restroom on the north end would be three hour everything else including the side of the parking that faces the cemetery would remain unrestricted at this time. So there was consensus there. There was also a majority consensus to implement a ban on limo and bus parking. There was a strong caution to so not before we go off of that I think we should definitely take a look at do you have it on here down Mulberry on that uh, no. ban, the limo and bus it's mostly if you limo. want to add Mulberry I can add it I just think that I, I'm not there often enough to know if that I don't think those bulb outs I'm not sure if the rest of the council can speak to this if those bulb outs have had the desired effect which is basically we've tried to stop commercial vehicles from going beyond that point I, it's had some, but when there's an overflow situation, people move beyond it. So I'm, gonna, okay. I'm not going to deny so maybe that. That's not so a that's, priority street. Maybe but I'm that. just saying, if you want to add it, it is not challenging for us to put one at that location, if you'd like to see that. Well, as I recall it, we were going to put those signs in those bulb outs that said that. Pardon? That it was going to be no commercial vehicles beyond this point. I don't recall that, okay. but we can go... much ink all right hold off on the respect our neighbors I think the not holding off on respecting I, our I, neighbors I, yeah <laughs> sign it, sign it. If, I didn't do it, you were gonna uh, sign if it's a sign that says no, that we might hold off on <laughs> um, and then I think I heard caution on the council as far as support for recognizing there may be value for a rideshare drop-off, but caution in what does that look like. So I think, again, what we were simply committing to here was doing the analysis and bringing something back. Mm -hmm. And I heard a couple of questions on, can we look at center turn lane, one way on Lincoln, and making it angled? So that's something we can add to the mix. Um, and I did not hear a lot of consensus on the working groups. Right. in terms yeah. of how you want to resolve those, to be honest, because some of them, uh, for example, the public-private partnership discussion needs to have the people that potentially are going to be the, um, the, the private partners, and that's a different conversation. But I understand the reticence of additional meetings and groups, so I would welcome your input on how we might further those themes. My suggestion re really was to delay them until we see what the effects are of some of these other activations. Councilmember Moeller. Uh, one thing that uh, staff brought up that none of us really touched on, and I'm going to kind of touch on it now, is the situation with the rear parking behind uh, the businesses. I, I find that's kind of my secret go-to spot because they they are always empty. Um, I know we don't want a bunch of signs, but um, maybe that's something we can reach out to uh, the chamber as part of those businesses. I mean, why are they not, you know, wh why don't they have people back there? And, and I agree with you that, that they typically don't. I just, uh, I always find parking well, there. I mean, it, most of them have parking plans. Why don't we? There's two different elements. It's not so much the employee parking management plan side of it. Those that do, the employees are gen generally parking there. It's the understated nature of the installation. How many of you know that Red Block, North Block, and um, Redwood, their, their sign that lets you know the parking entrance is so understated. The RH signage is facing the wrong way. You can't see it, and it's so little scale. The parking sign at Priest Ranch is not facing the driver. So these are the types of things that I'm saying are code and how the businesses are using it aren't helping us. So that's why, it, to me, it's a different conversation. And maybe it could be a small a small group of our planning staff working with the chamber, and we just go from there. Again, the prerogative here was trying to be, you know, try to understand what you were looking for and how you might want to move forward with that. 
because some of these could be a couple meetings and there's a recommendation and we go off with something. The, and I would, well, and I would hope the I, signage. I would, I would like to add this rear parking study with staff if that's really what it is because I've, I've heard that from uh, Ponches certainly that uh, they're always shooing people off because it looks like the uh, Stewart sign part, you know, you see the sign and the next lot you see is, is their driveway. So, and I've been to many of those back lots and they are empty. So uh, if there's a, a meeting or two that staff can have, I'm certainly open to s seeing if we can drive some parking back to empty areas. I think that one of the outcomes of us asking for subtle, understated signage is it's subtle and understated. Exactly. <laughs> and it has become less effective than we want. Some of the reasons that Steve brought up about where they are located and how they look is because we asked for that, right. frankly. And it's not working that well. One thing that we haven't brought up is technology. Um, I think, I want to say it was back at our workshop. It might have been after that. Um, I believe nowhere is there an opportunity to go on your mobile device and click on public parking lots in Yountville and have them designated so that Google Maps or some other type of uh, app can. Now I'm not saying counting which ones still have spaces, like at the airport. I'm saying where are they? And if, if we have that, great. We need to maybe figure out how to enhance it. But if we don't, a way that people can Google Yonville Public Parking and have blue dots show up or something, I think it helps add yep. to the signage that Councilor right. Muller was just I talking mean, about. We can put that together. It's not complicated, but it's also, I, I, I want to be really honest in a couple areas. We can do better programming. There are a couple of areas that I think supply is part of the issue we're going to have to address. But we can certainly put a map. I mean, in, uh, for those that watched the show that we put together when we went through, you know, the, the public parking and the right of way all along Washington is public parking. What we don't have that some people are thinking is we don't have these large lots off a side street that that's you know here's where you go to public parking we don't have that so we can direct people to both of the parks at the south end of town because <coughs> I, I would agree with you mayor that some people may find that if they're you know if you're traveling no yo go a block in and it might be at the park is preferred to parking in the residential area so those would be certainly some of the concepts that we could try to do and certainly put a map together um, and, and put that out there, so that's not a problem. I Thank mean, you. I did want to, uh, before I forget, recognize that there was an email uh, comment from members of the public that was sent in. Uh, that is part of the packet um, and has been copied for part of the record. Um, concern about um, late night parking and the uh, speed of vehicles late at night in the uh, neighborhoods. Uh, any further comments, Councilmember Durham? Yeah. Uh, two things, just to speak to the working groups, I'm, I understand your position. What I would like to suggest is I've spoken with the chamber at length about this. The businesses, according to the chamber, are ready to move forward with some sort of program. Given the, the fact that this construction is so far out, I would like to suggest that at least that work group happen because it's going to comprise um, a good amount of the business community who is well, who is ready, willing, and able to have that discussion and those ideas now. So I would like to suggest that for one working group. Um, and then secondly, to speak to the vice mayor's comment about the use permits, I understand your concern about going into all the other use permits, but at the end, of, and also, that still will be an issue moving forward and that it, that's part of the whole parking is local. There are certain businesses because of the way, I, I know you understand this, but there are certain businesses because of their use permits that will never ever be a part in the employee parking management plan. Bouchon will be a restaurant of some incarnation forever. Um, probably Bistro Jean T as well. So possibly moving forward, not to spend hours and hours of staff time, but some sort of evaluation to see possibly 
what, what type of mechanisms we can work with in the future, or else that middle of town is never going to change in terms of the parking um, requirements. So I, I do agree with that completely. So those are my two points. And, and I think you make a great point about getting the business community that has shown energy and engagement. Um, I would totally support that idea. Um, looking at three or four groups where we're expecting to have two members of um, this council and others seems a bit onerous and maybe premature. Uh, again, I'd like to see some results that we can be evaluating, but engaging the business community, absolutely let, let us get ideas from them, um, from the chamber uh, about how and what they're willing to do. They're recognizing this is, a, this is having a negative impact on their customers, mm -hmm. and so let them help us come up with reasonable solutions. And they, they, are, def yeah. they are definitely ready um, to have that discussion. So if we want to make a single group that has two members from here, uh, members from the chamber, and then if we feel like um, others from either Park and Rec and or GDRB would be appropriate, or Public Works, um, I'm just quickly scanning all three of the working groups that were listed in the staff report. Um, well, I, I'm willing to uh, help volunteer on that. I, I don't really see the need for kind of parks and rec. I think maybe we should uh, kind of start with a couple council members, some the businesses and, and the um, um, chamber, and then really kind of talk about what we, you know, start developing our own agenda and branch out to some of the uh, other possible groups if needed. I just um, don't want to say, yeah, we need some parks and rec people and not really know where we're going with this. Because it seems like it's not really one of our um, groups. We're inventing this group. We're kind of putting together uh, a different type of group for a different purpose. So maybe we can just kind of get started and kind of talk through uh, in an initial meeting what we think would be the best people to be involved. And, and maybe you have a good point. Maybe it, it is public works. Um, I don't know. Well, and, and based on this conversation, where my resistance really came down is looking at these very site-specific working groups. Yeah, I, and I so, agree. you know, Yonville parking lot, you know, the community center parking lot working group, North Washington working group, if there is a combination of all three of these that we want to create into one and include ZDRB, include Park and Rec, because some of these are adjacent to our, our parks especially, I could totally support that. I think we're just overtaxing our boards, commissions, and this council okay. by trying to create one for one block and one for another block and one for another block. So um, I kind of heard two members of the council volunteering to be on such a working group. Um, and so if the council agrees that we want to encourage ZDRB and Park and Rec members to also be a part of a single group that will look at a universal kind of analysis, I think that makes sense. Steve, how formal do we need to make that? Just clarification, ZDRB members weren't in the recommendation. Right here, signage working group. Signage working group. Okay, I'm not, saying I'm just looking at all three of the working sorry, groups. Yeah. So, okay. But if you're going to, I would suggest if you want to merge the YCC parking, and that came out of very specific council comments, with the North Washington, and we call that the public-private, I can come up with a working concept on that and, and work with you, and both of those would make sense to have a PRAC representative. Yeah, I would like that working group to analyze the entire area, not just those two. That's what I'm talking about. Careful. Yeah, but I think I'm now not volunteering to be honest. I know, <laughs> I, know <laughs> I just did. I just volunteered for something else. I so I can you decide what your priorities are as a like working the group? Yeah. Here, the, the reason I suggested the Washington um, Park, uh, the Washington Street at Yonville Community Park, was because there are specific businesses who are willing to step up to participate okay. to see that moving forward. I am more than happy to be a part of that committee to discuss these other items. I just want to make sure that uh, the first priority is we will be looking, I think should be looking at the park because those businesses are ready, willing, and able to move forward now. 
Good. And I'm more than happy. Idea. And I'm more than happy to follow up then with the others. Good. So I'm, I'm hearing Councilmember Durham and Councilmember Moeller, I believe, volunteering to be on this working group. Yes. If we can encourage at least one, if not two, members from the Park and Rec uh, Committee as well. Uh, certainly, I think, as you stated, members of the chamber, either staff or uh, business members, were have already expressed an interest. So. Yep. We can move that one forward. Yeah. Yes, w, since we're, I'll need you to come up to the mic. Since we're not in a public hearing, we can still in, include public comment. Hi, I'm Debbie Wellborn, 2910 Lincoln Street. Um, thank you for hearing me. I, I just, I, I have concerns about, you know, I think it's a good idea because we had talked about it previously on the west side of the park. But my concerns are the lighting because with the residents, um, right now, the way the lights are, I mean, they affect us. They, they still shine in our windows, even though they may have been reduced. And if you add the diagonal parking, I know you're going to put in more lighting, and I just hope that, you know, um, it's, you will look at it and... So, so I will answer first, if Steve has to follow up. Uh, thank you for that. I know thank we've you. talked about this uh, at great length in the past. Yeah, um, thanks. What I would ask is... Let this working group come together, okay. be a part of that conversation yeah, with I the like working to. group, uh -huh. share your concerns, and we're not saying that we're going and striping these things tomorrow. Okay, thanks. So, okay. But we are prioritizing where we want our areas of attention to be. Okay. And I apologize for being late. I, there was a wildlife issue, so I had to. That's okay. <laughs> they came first. So, okay, but thank you. What I would like to also add, the design of the improvements okay can be done to try to address the concerns that you're doing. So for example, you know, the open fence that is there now may need to be different so that it blocks the light. Oh, okay. So that, what I want you to think about, that's all part of the equation about what a project going forward might look like taking in to consideration those concerns. And may, I, may I say one more thing? And then the diagonal and making Lincoln a one-way street my fear on that is you're going to have every car is going to have to go around the park. So, like, as, as of now, being that it's two-way, a lot of times the people that come to the park and park at the north end, they'll turn around and go out on Washington and not travel all the way around. So I have a concern about will every car that comes to the park drive in front of, you know. Um, yeah, just a concept that we're looking at yeah, because just, we hear from many other people parking is the biggest issue, not I traffic know. flow. And right, so right. we're trying to find out if there are options we could consider. And I appreciate, thank you, thank you, I appreciate your. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone right. else, last, last uh, comment on this? I know we've got a couple other important things to get to. Okay, last comments from the council. I have one last comment. Uh, I, because I, I know the last time we had our um, parking workshop, there was uh, a lot of comments about the community center parking. I don't think that, uh, at least I'm going to speak if I'm wrong, that we're reversing that. I think what we're doing is prioritizing that. So just so staff gets that message, we're trying to actually pick the low-hanging fruit here, but that's not off the list. Am I correct? Right. Ed nodding. More than willing to discuss that issue. Clear direction, Steve? More or less. That's all you're going to get tonight. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot better than we've got. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Some things that we'll be able to move forward, bring in, and getting started on. So all thank right. you, yes. All right, thank you. Uh, we are going to move on to our next item, item 10C, which is a follow up of the uh, cannabis conversation. Um, let's get to that item here. <coughs> Thank you all. And let's see, we have Steve. <coughs> Please, go ahead. Thank I know you. we've kind of brought this to you, so you can start and then we'll talk. Yeah. Or while you're choking, oh, we can you. talk. Okay. Mayor Council, this is a, um, a request for some guidance on the part of the council as to how they might wish to move forward or not with a, a couple steps where we're at with regard to 
um, potential cannabis dispensary. As the council and the community may recall, the council voted to appoint a cannabis ad hoc committee that was tasked with doing a little more research and analysis, and, and they've been in that process. In addition, the town council as a whole has had multiple workshops um, and variety of discussions and has taken different actions at different point in time regard your cannabis policy. Your cannabis policy as it currently states is you ban outdoor personal grow, you ban outdoor commercial cultivation, you ban warehousing distribution and labs, and you ban a dispensary, and you permit delivery. So those of all, and just for reminder, we initially started with a complete ban and then you had discussion move forward with delivery over several. So the, the question mark here is a request has been made um, on the part that um, Council Member Durham wants to withdraw from the Cannabis Ad Hoc Committee. And he also raised the question that perhaps this discussion and the feeling that this is a item that maybe the council as a whole is better prepared to have the dialogue than the ad hoc committee. So the question really before the council, there's two questions. One, if you want to continue using the ad hoc committee structure, you would appoint somebody else to the cannabis ad hoc committee and continue down that path and direction. The other question that we're looking at is if the council as a whole wants to make a decision about are you interested in looking at and having discussion as to what the potential zoning and regulatory framework structure to permit a dispensary would be? Yes or no. And a yes vote is not an indicative vote that you're going to vote in favor of a dispensary, but only that you would want staff. I've attached a prior staff report that outlined a series of questions and conversation that we need council input to give you an idea of what the forthcoming discussion. But tonight's discussion is simply limited to the two with the vacancy on the cannabis ad hoc committee. Do you want to fill it, continue down that path, or do you want to move forward as a council of a whole and say, no, we're done, we don't want a dispensary, or no, we want to work on looking at what the framework would look like. And that's my staff report. Yeah, just to reiterate, you said it clearly, but to say it again, we're not writing an ordinance tonight. We're not identifying a specific location that might be viable. What we're really asking the council to decide is are we going to continue to consider and ask staff to put a more detailed report together for future consideration. Uh, we want to get some of your input as well on this. And this also stems from um, the difference in what was voted on with Prop 64 and the legalization of recreational cannabis and the support that that got, <coughs> whether it was in Yonville or throughout Napa County, and how that differs from the dialogue we had during our Envision Yonville general plan discussion and other discussions about does that mean we want a retail element specifically here in town? And if the council says, as Steve said, no, we have decided that we do not want a retail element here, then we don't direct staff to do any more work on it, and we settle the issue and feel satisfied with the legal delivery being sufficient and, of the, and the legal home grow to be sufficient. Um, if we agree that we want the Cannabis Ad Hoc Committee to continue, then we can we continue that conversation and look to add another member to join the vice mayor. So, or two new members, if so be it. Still accurate? Said the same thing you just said, but louder, right? <laughs> okay. Um, any questions of what we're trying to do, or before I invite members of the public, let's anyone here would like to talk about this, please come on forward and let us know your thoughts. Yes. You sat through everything else, so you gotta might as well talk now. Hello, I'm Megan Mason. 
Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. I'm going to just read some things just to help me flow through this. Um, in reading the town of Yountfield's website, it states, nestled in the heart of the Napa Valley among vineyards between the Mayacamas Mountains and Napa River, the town of Yountfield is a community that cares about its citizens, businesses, and visitors. It continues to elaborate the population's 2,933 people, known as the culinary capital of Napa Valley, has its own AVA, and the visitors will enjoy a small town atmosphere known for first-class restaurants, luxury hotels, inns, prominent wineries, and shopping. This has all been um, achieved through a lot of hard work by you and your predecessors. So my question to you is why do we want to disturb that perfect scenario by bringing in a retail cannabis store? Um, I attended one of the conference, the, one of the meetings, and it, it seemed, I thought, um, apparent from the panel that uh, it really, I remember one gentleman, I think it was from Vallejo, and he was saying that bottom line, it's not, it wasn't a profitable venture. It's, uh, you know, you've got the, the security problems, 24-hour uh, security, parking, driving disturbances of the neighborhood. Obviously, we're talking about parking issues here. Uh, it's just another layer I think you're going to be adding to um, our new complexity. Uh, for me, I thought if Napa has its dispensaries, what I think they're for, I looked up when on the website, you're allowing delivery. Deliveries can be done, I saw. You could get your order in by 2 o'clock. You can get it that day. So I'm asking, I just don't understand why the town of Yountville, with 3,000 people, feels the need to um, do this. We have five parks in our town. We have our community hall. We have a school, a daycare. And all of these are obviously children related. So where logistically does such a dispensary get located where it's not disturbing residents, children, traffic? Um, bill, as I was reading the bill, 1356, it states that uh, 15,000 residents can s handle a one dispensary. We have 3,000 residents. I just don't understand it, and I, I guess I'm going to conclude in this last uh, summary that was done on April 16th, saying, concluding the strategic goals and objectives was the quality of life. The town enhances the livability of Yountville by providing well-maintained public facilities, parks, trails, and equality programs and events. So I just ask that we keep that quality of life for our residents as well as our visitors and um, not bring a retail establishment to our town. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I'm just going to clarify a little bit. We're not proposing that we bring one. We are having a conversation about whether we want to stop talking about it or okay. not. Okay. Well, I, that's, I just felt yeah. I had just to, to be a little clear. Yeah. yeah. But thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Megan. I'm Pat Alexander, 6527 Heather Street. Um, I want to begin by saying I did support the legalization of marijuana in California, and I understand that uh, that times are changing, and that's a good thing. And I think that people have the ability um, to go forward and to, if they want to um, enjoy cannabis, so be it. That's a great thing. Megan and I have been really kind of championing the community and the neighbors and the the life of Yauntville for the past 29 years and we just want to keep bringing back the idea that we have a general plan and we really enjoy the rural beautiful uh, residential family um, nature of Yauntville and the question um, what I'd like to put forward to you is if you will continue the current ban um, regardless of what my own private feelings are I don't think that it's in keeping with our our families um, our communities, our parks, our recreation departments, that there are plenty of delivery options. There are ways that people can do that. I've been to several dispensaries myself. I can attest to, to parking, to lines, to things of that nature, to the, natu uh, the nature of a cash-based um, 
transaction. I understand that completely, and I just don't think that, you know, armed guards and, and um, a dispensary is right for our town at this time. So what I if could like to respectfully do is to ask you to continue the current ban and to not go forward uh, with Mr. Durham stepping down on the ad hoc advisory committee. It means that we'd have to find another person to go forward, and I would encourage you just to, to uh, continue the ban, and thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, welcome. Hi. Uh, good evening. My name is Sean Donahoe. I've been working in cannabis and hemp industry for about the last uh, seven years. Uh, I'm working at the state level and working at the local level. I'm a member of the State Regulation Committee of the National Cannabis Industry Association and founded the largest uh, state trade association. Um, uh, Rereading the staff report from earlier, um, I, uh, there was a lot of discussion, and I did attend one of the workshops, I believe, one of the visioning workshops with the panel that was previously mentioned by one of the speakers. Um, I, I, I go back and I look at the setbacks requirements, um, quote unquote, that are discussed um, at length in the staff report, and um, unpacking some of the genealogy there, there was no um, necessity for these setbacks. There was no impact that was ever decided upon. Um, the original law that was drafted uh, back in 2010 was 600 feet, and, and much of that was, was due to the continuing prosecutorial guidance of the U.S. attorneys and drug-free school zones. You shouldn't peddle drugs around a school. Now, that's not, of course, what these state-licensed, fully regulated, fully compliant track and trace banking is accessible. Um, um, uh, establishments are. It's like night and day. Um, these are the places that um, have been shown through non-anecdotal but actually data um, collected in numerous municipalities in California to reduce crime um, within a, um, a, a certain designated radius as well as to uh, reduce teen use within a three mile radius according to a long term longitudinal study within California of all um, California teenage school children. So if, if the, in the wisdom of the city, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit logistically, it doesn't fit because there's insufficient parcels, or if it doesn't fit in terms of the, um, the character of the city, or um, if the process of a subcommittee or an ad hoc committee doesn't make sense, so be it. However, let's use facts. Um, there is no requirement for armed guards. There is absolutely the ability to achieve banking. There is no um, other than anecdotal evidence that this would lead to an uptick in crime or teen use. All evidence stands to the contrary. Um, what you've seen in the last um, year and a half, obviously, is um, very high-end resort towns from Vale to Aspen to Breckenridge to Steamboat Springs. They all um, have um, very active boutique cannabis shops at a high-end capacity. Um, here in California, I've worked um, specifically with friends of mine that um, have licenses in both Ojai as well as um, opening up soon in Carmel. Um, it's not in the city of Carmel, it's actually in Carmel Rancho, if you know the barnyard. It's governed by the county of, um, of, of Monterey. And there's actually two dispensaries, um, both recreational, within 250 feet of each other. Um, this is adding to the, the character of communities, it's adding to the retail component, it's adding to spillover pedestrian um, uh, commercial activities, and, and if, if, if there's a spot to do it, I would encourage to be open to the process. Um, I wouldn't, um, seeing a lot of the, um, the processes throughout the state, I wouldn't really recommend opening and doing a, a beauty contest or anything like that. I would s instead suggest that if there's um, a seemingly compliant location, be open to, to um, considering it on a discretionary basis and perhaps employing some, s some sort of a development agreement. That would be a long-term co contract between the city and the prospective operator that would bind them to operational standards, community benefit plans, so and so on. I could go on all night, but um, I think that um, it's great that you're having the conversation. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and uh, esteemed Councilman. My name is Anthony, and I'm a public policy strategist for NorCal Cannabis Company. I'm based out of Santa Rosa, so a good amount of my time I am looking around the state and looking at all the different ordinances and uh, regulations that are going on and kind of seeing, you know, where, where people are. Um, so I just want to say, I do want to say that it's great that you guys are at least addressing this, and there are so many other cities and counties that don't, that have kind of just stuck to the moratorium and want to continue that. Um, but, you know, November 2016, there was Prop 64, and in, uh, in the Yachtville, it, they passed by 63%, um, and that's the thing, they voted for access for medicinal and also recreational cannabis, and at this moment, there is no access currently to regulated uh, cannabis at the moment. 
So when so when municipalities continue to ban recreational cannabis, it only empowers the the uh, unregulated or the black market, as those say. So um, so currently, 75% of all cannabis that is currently getting sold um, or even moved around in California is in the unregulated market. Um, so those individuals who are constituents of your area who are purchasing this unregulated cannabis, they're they're open to a lot more opportunities for uh, risks. Where, where, you know, in regulated cannabis industry, you have to have testing for pesticide contaminants, you know, uh, ensuring that it's, that it's going to be CEQA, um, you know, uh, it's going to work, it's going to work with the CEQA expectations. Um, so when, so when it, so when you just continue to have a moratorium, you kind of just gloss over that and you also put your constituents at risk. Um, so also, regulated cannabis is positive for community. Um, oftentimes, there are people speaking out of fear and uh, not actually in fact. Um, so today, actually, I wanted to bring you guys, um, I have, there's a uh, little report on debunking dis, um, dispensary myths. Um, so there's, it's data driven, there's 42 different reports. Um, so some of them um, come from the, uh, you know, Journal of Crime and Justice, Journal of American Medical Association of Pediatrics, um, you know, or the Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, but the thing is what they say is that this is, this actually positively affects property value. This does not increase uh, adolescent use. It actually possibly decreases it because what's going on right now is that there's just a huge stigma, and obviously we heard this today. There's a stigma going on and uh, where they're saying that this, that cannabis cannot be in somewhere, and it cannot be in, so in somewhere in a high value area, which I completely disagree. I would encourage you guys to look at, look at the idea of uh, West Hollywood. Um, where they have these actually on-site consumption areas, and these are going to be very nice places, and it adds to their tourism, adds to their TOT tax, and you know, adds to these, these different things to actually bring in individuals. So I think we need to work on getting away from that stigma um, of saying that you know that there are only certain kind of people who consume cannabis, or you know, or that this is going to be a detriment because with the current regulations going on in regards to what it is for dispensary or even delivery, um, we are the I guess is the highest regulated industry in the nation right now, more than pharmaceutical, anything of that sort. Um, so I think that's really important. So I did want to make sure that I, d I did have copies for uh, everybody here as well as make sure to get to the clerk. Yep, yeah. Thank you. Go. And also I will save some over here if anyone would like to see it. Um, but yeah, I totally agree on the idea where luckily you guys have the ability to choose how, how, how you want to have access, but I do think it is so, it's so important to have access um, to regulated cannabis uh, in this area. So I totally understand the idea of not having dispensaries, but delivery is so discreet, uh, you know, and also not a lot of signs uh, where people do not know where those are, but it will have a, a way um, for individuals who want to be able to have that access, who may even need it on the medical side to be able to have that access. Um, and I know in Napa right now, uh, yeah, they, uh, well, so there was a initiative that was going to be going, and now they decided, the board of supervisors decided that they will then, uh, you know, actually work on an ordinance, and then they make that decision in December w what it is. So that's not promised. So the argument of, well, Napa's doing it, but there still isn't a access for individuals here. Um, I did also want to hit a couple, I noticed some points that people had said, but I think Sean hit some of these as well. But yeah. So we currently, we're, we're a vertically integrated business. We do cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, uh, you know, delivery. We do all delivery for San Francisco as well as um, through, through uh, you know, one of our platforms, Ease, as well as, um, you know, we have uh, st uh, dispensaries across, across the state. So with that, none of those are cash-based. And I understand that definitely was a concern originally um, with banking. Um, but, you know, there are credit unions that are, that are being more open, um, and they allow us to be able to do that. So I... I totally understand when something is majority cash based how that could be a concern in safety, um, but that is not a, that is not a factor anymore. That may have been a couple of years ago, but that is not something now. Um, if you I'll could just wrap up your comments. Yes, sorry. Thank you. And buffers, totally get it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, that was a wrap up right there. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Sharon Kraus, I disagree with much of what the prior gentleman said. As a resident. There's no place in Yonville for cannabis. Thank you. Anyone else like to come uh, comment on this? Okay. Uh, I'll bring it back for council consideration. Are there any questions of council? Uh, we have two things to consider. One is, are we going to uh, replace council member Durham on an ad hoc committee and continue research um, or not? I guess there's, that's the one thing. Uh, thoughts? I'll comment on that if okay. that's okay. Yes. Um, 
and the reason that I stated this to the committee and to the ad hoc committee and to the town is that it's been two and a half years since this process started. We've been to many, many um, seminars. We've traded many articles um, and had many meetings about it. So the time for me was the fact that it's been two and a half years. So while I respect the work that we've done, it's either it's time for the council to move forward, to have that discussion that if it is um, possible to have zoning in Yonfield, then let's have that discussion. If not, then we don't allow, we don't vote to move forward. There's really no reason to have an ad hoc committee if we're not doing anything. So that was my reason for the start of that discussion. Um, you know, I wanted to give staff direction. I wanted to be clear. We've been hanging out here for about two and a half, two and a half years with this discussion. And I felt by finally bringing this forward, we have an opportunity to have more of an in-depth conversation of how to, how to discuss what zoning would look like in Yonville and therefore if it would be possible that a dispensary would be somewhere in Yonville. So that answers actually both of the questions. I think I did the, maybe it was a compound question. One question with two parts, but thank you. Uh, other thoughts, Councilmember Dornbecker? Well, um, actually, as far as I'm concerned, I drive to Napa to go to Trader Joe's and Whole Foods. I don't think it's a, too much to ask if um, people wish to purchase cannabis that they drive 10 minutes. But uh, so I, I just don't, unless and until a business one of our businesses came forward and said, yes, well, we would like to locate it in you know, the marketplace or we would like to locate it in the, if, they, if it was requested by a, a, a business in our town, I would be more prone to consider their request. But um, I think that the, you know, having legal delivery and having the ability to grow six plants in your home that's that's a, a freedom that we have so I don't um, I don't feel compelled to have a dispensary in the town of Yonville so I think once we get through the rest of the conversation from the council if um, because there are kind of two parts to this if it's the position on dispensary there's also a the decision, do we want to continue to research it? And so we're not definitively saying yes, no to a dispensary tonight. If we agree as a council, no, we don't want to even continue researching it, that's a no to the dispensary and a no to the discussion. We have the ability to say yes to continue the research and hold on to the ultimate decision. By continuing the research with an ad hoc committee, we are not committing ourselves to having a, a retail space. Just to clarify, because I think you bring up a good point about um, just wanted to make sure that there was that clarity of, of the difference. We're not we're not saying yes to something. If we the, could say no to something. If the majority of the council members are are interested in continuing the conversation, then I will I would support that. Okay. Yeah, Councilmember Muller. Um. This is uh, one of those things that uh, I think that there's a lot of different angles to kind of come um, come at it uh, at. Um, my personal opinion is I hate banning stuff. It's, there's just a lot of collateral damage from you start banning this and you start banning that. So uh, that out of the way. Um, one thing I've been surprised at is um, once we've uh, really had this discussion, I guess it's been two and a half years ago because we formed an ad hoc. So thank you for setting that that timeline. And we we just you know we had some difficult discussions, and we uh, allowed delivery, and we followed up, and we hear that we have delivery, and uh, they come into town. I've been surprised just how silent this community 
really has been on making any changes. And, uh, you know, I've certainly asked, and, it, you know, there was, there was a lot of discussion, you know, I have to be able to grow it, I want to grow it inside, outside, and, and all that. And uh, of all the topics that we kind of deal with, this is the one that gets the most silence. You know, you don't really hear a lot of support, yes, I really need this, or man, and this is, the, you know, my life will end, you know, if this happens in, in Yonfil. So uh, if, if the council wants to continue to um, discuss it, I certainly don't want to talk about it. I talked about it a lot in the 60s and the 70s, so I'm kind of done, but uh, I, you know, I think if there's any new changes, I, I would like to see what, you know, um, our big city, you know, Napa ends up doing. They're they're going to have a lot of discussion, and uh, I'd like to see uh, what they come uh, up with. So I'm kind of okay right now with the status quo, unless uh, the council wants to keep discussing cannabis. I'm not going to be opposed to that, but I don't want to keep. Uh, I don't. I don't want to volunteer for the ad hoc. So um, that's kind of where I am, kind of in the in the neutral zone. You've already committed to one working group for the night, so. Did I? Did oh, I yes. <laughs> Everybody's shaking their yeah. head. Vice Mayor, your thoughts? <laughs> Joking. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jeff, Councilmember Durham, for calling the question on this, as we put it. Um, I think it is timely to discuss this tonight. And thank you for taking I didn't realize it had been two and a half years but thank you for um, taking the two and a half year journey with me on the ad hoc we started in a two by two by ever how many with the county we did our own workshop and with our community <coughs> council we had our survey as you said we've traded a lot of articles we've gone to a lot of seminars we have even read bills moving through the legislature and um, I do hope that our work and I do think that the ad hoc has served a good purpose to get us to where we are today that this is that we are able especially to crystallize the question that we now need to answer as a council and I just appreciate the opportunity of worked with you and I hope we have the opportunity to put our heads together again sometime um, as far as uh, I do think probably the committee may have run its course uh, because I think the kinds of questions or the question that we've now moved to is really more of an entire council question. It's really more of a policy question. Once the policy is decided, then you can get to the circles of where something might be or where not where it might not be. So I I am okay with dissolving the committee. I think it's uh, probably a good step and the right step um, as far as pursuing a conversation um, as I've gotten more into this my most recent driver has been um, I want to be proactive rather than reactive and I think at the April workshop I made it clear that some of the bills moving through the legislature um, were a little disconcerting to us as a small town um, but I have now uh, spoken with the town attorney and the town staff and I feel that um, we will have good knowledge and a good lead time that if we were to defer any further zoning or other kinds of discussions, we still would have enough lead time to put something in place to protect ourselves. So I also agree with um, Council Member Doran Becker that uh, although I realize the difficulty when a business comes to a staff member and says, um, hey, I want to put a dispensary here, a staff member has to say, well, we don't have an apparatus for that or a process for that right now. Um, but that doesn't mean that that business, if they really want to be in Yachtville and they really feel they're a good match for us, that doesn't mean that that business can't say, well, I would like to go to your council during public comment and I would like to say, I would like to put a dispensary here. And then we are open. Uh, we haven't banned anything. We simply have not taken up anything else, but we could at that time. So I am okay to let it go for now. Um, I also will echo uh, council members' 
uh, Dornbecker and Mueller and say that if there is a strong feeling, not necessarily of the majority of the council, but of any council members who feel they want to pursue discussions, I'm not going to say no to that because I think discussions almost always have some productive outcome. But left to my own device, I would leave it where we are now with dissolving the committee. Okay, thanks. I um, I feel like, and, and again, thank you to uh, not only our ad hoc committee members who have done extra uh, work on this um, collectively. I don't know how many seminars we've all gone to, virtually every uh, conference, uh, League of California Cities and others have been drilling down pretty pretty far on this issue. Um, it's still very much kind of in motion. I think there's um, there was great excitement and expectation about this windfall of business uh, that's working itself out in um, a way that, you know, even though the state has not reaped the same levels of uh, revenue that were at least hoped for. Um, the, to me, there is a difference between what the vote about Prop 64 was and whether that meant that means local business, local retail here in Yonville. Um, and I think we did, in fact, hear that uh, during our Envision Yonville meetings, we had, and we did have, I, I disagree about the silent community, we had residents say, we use cannabis not just recreationally, but especially medicinally. It would be a um, quality of life improvement to not have to go <laughs> even the 10 minutes. I get that uh, because harvest is right down there off of Highway 29 in North Napa, um, but for some, um, that it still is debilitating to go even that short a distance. In our minds, it's a short distance. Um, I'm open to continuing the conversation. If that's in an ad hoc structure, I would volunteer myself to, to join the vice mayor on an ad hoc committee. If we dissolve the ad hoc committee, um, that doesn't mean we stop our own individual research, consideration. I will agree about the um, the vocalness of support and opposition. Uh, I would say when we bring this up, there is more opposition that comes to us than there is support from our residents. And I totally respect the gentlemen that are here representing the industry. And there's a lot of very valid data that I think needs to be what's driving the decisions whether it be at this level or um, other levels. Um, but we are a very unique community, and we are very protective of our community. Um, I get the sense that we want more of that data before we feel confident of the results that have come out so far, uh, because we do here at the county level. There's a lot of conversation at the county level right now about should there be commercial cultivation? Should there be uh, more retail opportunities? And other jurisdictions are giving some of their feedback. Some of it is mixed. Some of it is more negative than positive. And some of it is positive. So that gives us a whole range of data points to consider. So um, I don't like banning things either. I think um, we let the the market dictate. We, I personally, and I know others, have been approached by people interested in opening a business here in Yonville. Um, I'm not convinced that it's the right thing for us, but I'm not convinced it's the wrong thing either. Um, so I'm going to continue conversations and research, like I said, on my own is fine, and I'm sure others will do it on your own as these sessions continue. Uh, if, if we want to continue the ad hoc, we can do that. Um, but I also understand if you feel like it's going to run its course for now, um, that's okay too. So um, I get the sense that nothing definitive is going to happen tonight, which is what I tried to clarify earlier, unless we want to stick with the ad hoc committee with a new um, membership of that committee. That's really the decision for us tonight is do we want the ad hoc committee to stay in place and move forward, or do we want to do this in an independent, less structured way? So 
Uh, but I agree, uh, Councilmember Durham, I appreciate uh, bringing forward to to get us at least inching closer because we're still, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not satisfied by saying we're not going to say definitively yes or no, but I feel like it's better to uh, keep open-minded going forward. But I also respect the fact that if you feel like you're spinning your wheels now um, and have ideas that you want to move forward, but not if we're not really engaging, um, I can totally respect that. So, I mean, I, I guess I'll ask the vice mayor if you want to continue uh, in this capacity, and if you don't, then we can dissolve it and just kind of work independently. Um, I mean, I would be happy to continue the committee. Uh, you have been the alternate, so you're very much up to speed. But you guys have never let me join you, <laughs> so. Now that's I might be, you know, be careful what I wish for. That's because they always have really good snacks at yeah. the uh, conventions. Um, but I would like um, some direction from council on are we looking, so I think we might need to sort of refocus our mission or our mandate for the ad hoc of are we now moving into a zoning kind of research? I, that's a great question that I'm going to answer based on because I know Steve wants direction, mm -hmm. and that's why I that's why I called for the or called for this discussion because I've done a ton of work on zoning. I've um, I've done research from the other um, uh, other uh, workshops that we've gone to the um, League of California Cities and all their information that they've given us given us, um, and so I have a ton of zoning ideas. But then that was one of the places where I stopped talked to the town and said, I don't know why I'm moving forward with this if this is not a discussion that the town wants to have. So, and that's why I asked for this. Um, I don't, for me, I don't see that there's any discussion to be had if there's, if we're not going to move forward with it. What I'm hearing, and I know I'm one of them saying it, but I want to make sure the majority of us are saying it. What I'm hearing is that we are not prepared to outright prohibit and not consider anything going forward. It is prohibited now, but. So in effect, we are. If, if now, we, but if, if we, we don't. also said, correct. We're, and we're not going to continue discussing it, it's a done deal, um, then that's a more definitive prohibition. And what I'm saying is that I'm comfortable with the status quo as it is now, which is we allow delivery, but we don't allow any other commercial or retail uh, opportunities in Yountville. But I'm willing to continue researching it. I'll take some of all the work you put forward and, and analyze that as well. And to come back, if we are going to do the ad hoc committee, I want to come back with specific zoning information, what places, if any, would even be considered, because we're pr talking almost exclusively about the west side of Washington Street, which is private property, and private property owners may say, we're not interested, and then that gets us to the final. Well, and I've but got that's to bring not, you back. But that's not I've, necessarily yeah. the case either. And that's, that's, why, that's why I brought it up, because if once you start looking into the zoning, what other communities have done, there are other ways to look at it, or there are other considerations. And so that's why I wanted to give staff direction of, we're not doing it, or this is the way to look at it. This is the way to present it to the council for the council to have the discussion. And these are the possible areas. If we want to do it, great. If not, then that's fine. We don't move forward. All right, Steve. The challenge that you face is that, uh, again, zoning can be addressed in a number of areas, and it's, it's talking about where you would consider allowing it. And you need to think about it as the simplest of the bubbles if you're going to do it. Just like what is allowable. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to go in because a potential applicant would have to find the space, go through all of the conditional, and then you would have your regulatory framework that would be more significant. The challenge we have right now and what really scares me is I don't think it's a good place to be where you go, oh, when somebody really puts pressure on us and says they want to come here, let's develop our framework because it could look like it has potential for favoritism. Do we know the person? What, I mean, I think if you're going to do it, you should be doing it from a proactive standpoint, outlining what limitations, what controls, what structures you want, 
And then the person, just like any other business comes in that would have to, to look at where you're coming in with zoning. Because right now, if somebody comes in, and we've had four, four significant people come in with backgrounds and packages, I have to tell them the answer is it's banned. I don't know where the council might consider it. I don't know what the process to grant you an approval would be. So you're, you're putting staff in a really awkward spot by, you know, because right now I want to be really clear, you have a ban. And if you're okay with that, staff's okay with that, but that's what we're going to say. If you want us to work on it, we do need better direction on what it is your outcome is. And one last little thing, um, Tony and I were reminding a, um, you're no longer an ad hoc committee. You need to be a standing committee. We went through that last time. So it's you know, subject to Brown Act because an ad hoc committee by its nature that has been lasted two and a half years is not really ad hoc. Um, so anyway, just uh, it's just it's frustrating from that standpoint, and I hear that from. But it's you know, if we want to do more research, we need a better understanding at the staff level is what is it you're looking for. So let me let me ask the council to if there is a motion to explicitly consider continue the ban that is currently in place, we should consider that. And if that motion passes, then that does call the question literally. If the decision is to not, we're not undoing the the prohibition, but we would be allowing for further consideration. I guess even with the prohibition, there's con further consideration possible going forward. So always. But I think in the interest of trying to make a definitive statement tonight and not just continue to be completely vague, that's what I'm trying to get at is either a vote to say, yes, we want to continue researching and consider it. And within X number of months, we are going to have more data to base our decision on yes or no, up or down. Or is tonight the night that we say, no, the council does not want to continue going forward and researching it, period. And so I welcome a motion in either direction if we want to go that way. Um, otherwise, all we have to decide potentially is if it's now the vice mayor and myself as, a, as members of the standing committee to continue this and we just continue the current status, which is all things are banned except for legal delivery. Still looking at you to make sure that I'm saying that right. That's correct. And six plants indoor. And six plants indoor. So. I'll make a motion. Okay. I'll make a motion that we direct staff to work with the council to discuss plant, um, zoning ordinances and requirements for the town of Yon for the town of Yonville to accommodate a cannabis retail recreational cannabis dispensary so further discussion with no guarantee of an outcome but it would be to create a structure that currently does not exist correct May I ask Vice a Mayor? question? Yeah. Uh, and you said with the council, so th your motion includes um, disbanding the standing committee? Correct. It would all happen at the council Correct. level? So we could take what we have and bring it to the council and to the uh, staff to move forward with it. So basically either at a regular meeting or potentially a special meeting or workshop or whatever we call it to thoroughly evaluate how we might create an ordinance and a zoning structure. I won't call it a workshop, but yes. Thank you. So there is a motion to that effect. Is everybody clear on the motion? Is there a second? We're not using our no. electronic, right? No. I will second that motion that we bring this back uh, at a future meeting for uh, and instruct, I believe you're saying instruct staff to create potential draft ordinance language and zoning. I, I, I want to work with the staff to give them our input on what we want for the zoning for retail cannabis. 
And I'm going to phrase that slightly different. I'm going to bring you back to an attachment that's in your staff report. Yes. We've been, if we want to move forward with a discussion, staff would suggest a two-pronged approach, which would be one, we actually go through the staff report in detail, that's the attachment, and you guys provide direction and, that, and guidance exactly. to the questions that staff outline, and then based on your feedback, we will bring you a draft framework back because we don't want to take a stab and have, we'd much rather you go through the detailed so questions, give us your input if that's the direction you want to go. So that motion is to move forward with those questions that you had, which I've answered on, on my side, which I want everybody to answer. Then we come back, present it to the staff, see what we agree on, see if we agree on anything, and then what would work for retail dis cannabis dispensary in Yonville. Which question is that? Um, it's attached to the, um, it's attached to the, um, it's cannabis staff report, April 16th. So is this even necessary to have a motion, Gary? Or is this just general direction for staff to bring back a future agenda item? So this is direction. Your agenda title does allow action, though, to the extent you want to vote. So we kept it on there so that there could be a formal direction from three of you on a vote so that s staff would have clear direction. Okay. So there is a motion and a second to that. Now, it was potentially modified or it was enhanced by Steve. I don't know what it was done by Steve. I think we're, we are both saying the same thing. Michelle, do you have any uh, – do you have clarity on what we're – what the motion is? Mm -hmm. Could you read it back so that everyone is clear? Really? <laughs> <laughs> yes, really. Um, I have that uh, Council Member Durham is directing staff – is directing staff to work with Council to discuss zoning ordinance and requirements for the Town of Yonville to accommodate a retail cannabis dispensary, which – the mayor then further clarified that it's creating a structure that supports council member Durham's request and that w council disband the ad hoc committee. And then there was further, further clarification that um, cannabis move forward with questions. And I can't read the rest of my writing on that, but that's where I'm at. And then Steve's comments go through the April staff report respond to the questions there, which will provide direction to staff with how they would come back to council with Good. further information to consider. Okay. okay. Exactly. Right. What I want to make clear is that we're not saying yes there were to, uh, you know, having a retail dispensary. So I want to make it clear that we're not saying that. We are saying that we want staff to put forth that information that we can evaluate as an entire council, not an ad hoc or a standing committee and make a decision in, in a future council meeting. That's how I understand it. Okay. And is that clear to council? Unfortunately, I'm not. I'm lost. I'm, uh, so th the motion is to um, have this discussion again, or? We're basically saying a yes vote would be to disband the ad hoc committee and instruct staff to create zoning language and um, ordinance language for the entire council to consider regarding how to zone and regulate a retail cannabis facility ba in town. Based on the council's feedback of the April 16, 2019 staff report with all the questions that are outlined in there. Is there enough clarity, Councilmember Muller? So we are going to be directing staff to really bring back this, based on a lot of this information, uh, this business could be zoned in this area or this but area or, or this area. Correct. And the April 16th uh, yeah. staff report has specific uh, separation requirements, has um, – zoning, separation from s specific areas in town, what zoning districts could be permitted, what your opinion is on other parks and churches. So answering all those questions in order to come up with some sort of zoning, if possible, for 
cannabis retail in Yonville? Again, we're not guaranteeing a business, but we are instructing staff to put together a structure and a format of uh, an ordinance. A multi-meeting format <laughs> that will be required because the first part will be to get your feedback, then the second part will be to create the draft zoning and regulatory framework based on your feedback and answers to those questions. So there is a motion and a second. Um, are you prepared to vote? Councilor Armour, are you prepared to vote? Uh, yeah, can I? I I'm uh, planning on voting no because based on if we're going to be using this, I, I am not open to many of the, even having a discussion about where some of these retail sites. Okay, so go. right now we're just voting yes or no on the, on the motion. We can, okay. if it's a yes, we'll get into the parts that are favorable and unfavorable in the future. So all in favor of uh, the motion as it's presented, please say aye. 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 There are three, did you get all three of those? And then opposed? No. Okay, so three to two. So okay. Vice she Mayor and Councilmember yeah. Moeller were no's. Thank so you. So again, what this means is we are saying, yes, we want staff to research this more, look at potential zoning sites, look at potential ordinance language to come back and based on the April uh, staff report, we will have another conversation where um, we will ultimately, I think at that point, it will be definitive whether we are going to move forward with the concept or not. So that's that item. Look at how well we give guidance. I know. It feels a little dissatisfying to me, too, that we no. didn't come up with the, something it. a little more definitive. But thank you, everybody, for your, your feedback. Uh, we have now uh, item 10D, zoning ordinance update. Sandra. Good evening. In June, the town council approved a PSA with O'Rourke and Associates for an update of the zoning and design ordinances. And it provides for an update of the entire code to implement the general plan. And if you look at page one and two of the May proposal, it will detail some of those work items. And it um, includes a couple of study sessions for the items related to outdoor lighting, signs, and temporary structures. And those items were pulled out aside from many of the other changes to the general plan because more direction is necessary before staff can start drafting that ordinance. Um, and the real focus of this effort is to make those comprehensive changes that are really addressing the general plan. And so when you look to pages um, one and two in that May proposal, it spells out all the different um, policies and programs of the general plan and explains how that will change the, um, the ZOTO. We're able to keep um, costs down for this work effort because this is a staff driven effort that's really based on all that detail and direction that's included in the general plan. We did enter into a contract with um, O'Rourke and Associates for about a hundred thousand dollar contract and we were able to encumber it out of um, last fiscal year's budget from um, remaining funds that we had. So when we introduced the work plan to the council later in June, we heard that there was an interest for a more engaged um, and involved process um, so that the council and the community could provide feedback on items of, of interest um, moving forward uh, before a draft was presented to the town council. So we've explored an expanded scope of service with the consultant and tonight you have before you an option to amend that process if you desire. Um, the biggest difference between the original proposal and the proposed approach um, is that the amended proposal would, um, would take a slower approach. It looks at doing it in three different phases rather than a single work effort that's approved in one action. It adds white papers for up to 14 topics and those subjects are outlined on page two of the July proposal. It goes into much greater detail on um, 
some of the ordinances that aren't triggered as a change out of the general plan, but which the council may wish to have discussion and give direction um, to staff. So the goal of the white papers is to look at the existing zoning and design ordinances and to explain the issue, to uh, describe what other jurisdictions are doing related to the issue, and then to present options for consideration and moving forward. And the, the last part of the, um, that change is that it um, takes those white papers to um, a potential ad hoc committee and back to the ZBRB and council for that input before drafting it. The other significant change from the existing proposal is that it adds specific site design um, and guidelines for the three change areas that um, were identified in the general plan, and that's the west side of Washington, the north Washington zone, and the Humboldt properties. But we've also included additional sites um, that are really the last really large remaining developable parcels. And so we've included the French Laundry Garden and the Catholic Church mixed residential property. And the idea is that this is an opportunity to really provide clear direction and agreed upon site specific design standards um, since we're doing a zoning ordinance update. And it, those standards could be useful in looking at the site layout of a property, the street frontage, circulation, building height and articulation, and it could include um, working with an architect to develop um, focused conceptual um, sketches and graphics that will help guide design both in terms of acceptable design and unacceptable design. They um, would be much more focused than the, um, the more conceptual ideas that we shared during the general plan process. It might be something to explain what we mean by um, a step back building element to avoid a vertical, uh, that verticality that we heard was undesirable as part of the general plan process. Um, so this is a comprehensive, reorganization, editing, and updating of the zoning ordinance and the design guidelines with a focus on making them easier to use, reconfirming or updating the regulations, and then of course better defining the community's um, vision for the change sites. These changes would increase the budget by about 117,000, which is comprised about 25,000 for the architectural design consultant and the remaining 92,000 for all the additional white papers, the additional meetings, and then the additional um, ordinance amendments that may result from that. And we have budgeted 130,000 in this year's fiscal budget, um, which we could allocate to this revised contract if the council so desires. Um, so with this said, we understand that that is a large ticket item. So we have explored some options with the design consultant to reduce the cost while preserving the process and the desired end result. And there are really three potential options here for your consideration. One is that the greatest opportunity for um, a cost reduction is to reduce the number of meetings by holding joint meetings of the ZBRB and the town council for each of those pairs of white paper topics. Um, and in, in the proposal before you, um, there, it's to add six additional ZDRB meetings, um, study sessions, and seven council study sessions. Combining those, we can um, hold eight joint study sessions, and what that would do is reduce the cost estimate by about 80 hours or $10,000. Another option is to limit consultant attendance, and that's Bob or Christine um, would attend one, um, a meeting on their own, but both of them wouldn't attend. Um, and that's at the ad hoc committee meetings and some of the ZDRB meetings and town council meetings. Um, and this could reduce the cost estimate by 76 um, hours or about $9,500. And then the last option is that we've budgeted for a complete overhaul of the 14 topics that are identified for the white papers. Um, but these could be scaled back. And what that allows is um, for us to, to bring you um, a topic on a white paper to see how far, if at all, we want to go with some of those proposed changes. And an example is that the General Plan uh, Environmental Impact Report consultant identified um, a couple of issues with the noise ordinance, and one of those relates to construction activity, which always um, violates the noise ordinance. So to bring the zoning ordinance into compliance with the general plan, we could do a quick fix that provides that that's an exception, 
or we could do a more um, extensive um, overhaul and discussion. But what the white papers do is allow that discussion. You may decide um, to only do the quick fixes or move ahead. And of course, since this is a project based on um, specific identifiable um, goals, if we scale back, it wouldn't um, exceed that amount. And um, so we can do the contract. I mean, we can do the zoning ordinance update at it as it is currently um, agreed to. Um, the question for the council is whether they'd like to expand that sp scope to have a more um, robust process and to um, have further discussion on some of these items that are not specifically um, identified as changes that are necessary as a result of the general plan. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Questions of the staff report? So, oh, oh, go ahead, Vice Mayor. Uh, thank you. And thank you for the staff report and the explanation. <laughs> Um, the zoning ordinances specifically, under the existing proposal, are we going to come out with a full set of revised zoning ordinances? Well, they're revised in the sense that they address all the changes in the general plan, but let me give you an example, Humboldt Street. We will rezone Humboldt Street to residential scaled commercial, and we'll have to identify that the lots are merged and that the residential use requirement is part of it. Um, but the existing design standards for the RSC district would apply, and those are that buildings should be smaller in scale, no more than 2,500 square feet um, with parking in the rear. So we have some guidelines, but not a lot. What these design guidelines could offer um, are more direction on the site layout. How should buildings be directed? How might we protect the residences? What type of height and design articulations do we want? That's not part of the original proposal, but that could be added on. Okay, and then um, it, it seems to me, I, I tried to do a compare and contrast of the original and the proposed, and it, it seems to me that the proposed also, and you tell me if I'm right or wrong, it, it also sweeps in some things that we have been talking about doing but haven't put on a work plan per se, like uh, findings, those kinds of things. So would we be getting some bang for our buck uh, in addition to just zoning and design ordinances if we yes. go the proposed route? I believe it's beneficial because it is comprehensive. We have these um, professionals that are assisting us and have this, this level of peer review to make sure that the design ordinances address the issues or that the um, ordinances address the issues that we want. Um, and so, yes, it's it's work that we've identified, but it sort of folds it all into this effort because this is the effort to redo the zoning and design ordinances. Yes. Thank you. So at the end of the report, it says, if the council desires to modify the scope and approach, staff recommends this adoption. Is staff recommending we make this adoption? I mean, this change? Is, are you saying that the original approach is inadequate? No, I don't think it's inadequate. I think we will get a zoning ordinance that is in compliance with the changes of the general plan with the contract as we've entered. But I do think that there's a lot of beneficial um, information that we can get out of this other update. I'm not recommending so much as giving you an option. It is a policy decision for the council. But by having this greater discussion, we can jump more, more in depth into these issues. And maybe simply having the white paper discussion will get some good direction and feedback. Um, the council might want to move forward with some of these items, but not all of them. But being able to understand what are the issues behind uh, with the existing ordinance and what are other jurisdictions doing and, and what are the options moving forward? Do you want to move forward with any of them? I do think that's positive. In short, I look at this as we heard a lot of feedback from the council when we presented it, and I'm going to call it you wanted more. You wanted more topics. I mean, when I say this, this is the council as a whole more engagement, more in depth. So what I would also say is you're correct. Staff added, a, you know, there's more brought in than was originally contemplated and asked of the consultant. And so that's why I would say it's an expanded, but it's also correct to say there's nothing wrong with the original approach. It's a different approach which has a, a narrower focus, um, you know, a, a less um, less of the ad hoc committee structure role. And staff was 
Uh, I think we're also a, a little surprised with the price point, but you know, more here in this case is a lot of staff time and meeting time. And we all know where, how that works. So the real question is, if you're interested in the enhanced and there's a few other projects thrown in there, we could do that. But, you know, we're not saying you're not going to get a complete project if you don't do the 116. We're trying to ask if this is really, based on your feedback from that, is this scale of scope, and granted, now that you know what it costs, you know, more costs more. So is, is more still on, is more still something you're interested in, or is maybe there's some guidance to staff to scale back some of it and, and add maybe a dollar amount that we could work with towards that? So the first bullet item, 10 council ad hoc meetings, 13 ZDRB meetings, 13 council meetings, and you're saying all 10 of the ad hoc council meetings would be additional from the existing approved process. 11 of the 13 would be new for the ZDRB. Let and me clarify this. These numbers got changed for some reason after I went on vacation. So, so be bef before we get down to the specific numbers, my point is this looks like a s more than significant increase in process after having gone through two years of a general plan update. And so whether it's 11 or 9 or 7, right. I'm thinking, wow, a lot. that's a lot. And so, and it's twice as expensive. So I'm kind of trying to get an understanding of maybe to the vice mayor's question about how much, I mean, kind of a return on investment are we really getting here? I'm still not clear why it takes 11 more ZDRB meetings and 11 more count or nine more or whatever the numbers to get the goal that we thought was perfectly acceptable before you say we're getting a broader analysis but how much analysis do we need so before we were looking at um, hold on I, I want to pull up these um, the work plan which is really the um, the goals and policies of the general plan, it's real specific that will um, create pop-up retail standards, we'll consider amending the design ordinance, we'll look at our sign regulations, whether, whereas this new scope adds things like um, the French Boundary Garden property site design criteria, the Catholic Church site design criteria, um, it pulls in the home occupations ordinance, the good neighbor practices, and why we want to look at noise and parking, um, which are not specifically identified as part of the original scope of work because they're not specific triggers from the general plan. But we know that these are ideas that um, maybe m perhaps could use some work, that we may want to look at those design guidelines in a little more detail. Um, and I guess just looking at it in terms that our zoning and design ordinances are old, and so this is an opportunity, but you know they generally sort of work. Um, that's why the RSC um, design standards could apply as they are to Humboldt, or we could decide to make it more specific because we have a chance to. We're okay sticking with the RSC standards. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions of staff report? Okay. Any member of the public? I'm guessing you don't necessarily want to drill down on this item right here. Um, so, further discussion? Who wants it? Councilmember Member Durham. Careful what you ask for because we get it, just like work, the parking workshop. Um, I, I, I spoke to um, town staff about this as well because I had um, <coughs> raised concerns about the um, consultant and wanting to move forward. So, of course, I saw this number and immediately knew that all of my concerns were were verified and I was correct but unfortunately after talking to town staff I changed my position because what they said made sense um, I believe that given all this time that we have spent on the general plan given where we are now I think this is the perfect time to do this yes it's more money than we had planned but I I firmly believe it's money well spent it's money specifically going towards what we have already worked on in the past to move forward. 
And also, this is not something that we were talking about doing five years ago, knowing that the general plan was coming up in the future. It's something, once again, that's following the general plan, and I think the timing is right. And I think that given the time and discussion we had and a lot of the feedback from the community, this shows a further dedication to all of that discussion and all of that community involvement as well. So I am perfectly behind this exact proposal of moving forward and the expanded proposal. I know it's a lot of workshops. I know it's a lot of meetings. But for something like this, for zoning design for the next 20 years of Yonville, I think it's very, very valuable. Thank you. Councilor Dornbecker. Um, can I ask for a clarification? Because I remember you mentioned that we could combine the ZDRB meeting with the council meeting and have eight meetings instead of the whatever. The seven. Yeah. So um, is that, is that? Or I'm sorry, no, it's a little bit more than that, but generally yes. Yeah. Um, so eight meetings total, but together, and it would also save some money, you said. So could we do that? and without losing any of the quality of what we're going to be doing? Yes. I reviewed that with the consultant um, over the last couple of days, and they um, believe we can get the same end result, yes. Uh -huh. All right, then. That's, that's better than 13 ZDRB meetings and <laughs> 10 additional council ad hoc meetings. So anyway. it's eight and nine. It's hard to keep all the numbers in one's head, but yes, it's a lot. Well. I'm persuaded by Council Member Durham's being persuaded um, because it does make sense if we've gone this far with the, the um, general plan update, I don't think we should take short measures and not have it be the best it can be. <coughs> Thank you. Council Member Muller? So um, is there a way that um, – See, I was concerned because I want, I was the one who uh, also voiced I wanted more detail. I had the impression that somebody's going to go away, you know, kind of behind the wall and work out uh, all, the, all the updates to our, you know, zoning and design ordinances. And it's like, here you go. Here's what we've got. So I didn't really like that approach. But what if um, – and this – Sounds to me, but you know, maybe not that this is probably going to extend things in, in a temporal manner. Which tell me how long, because I don't want to take forever. But isn't there a certain way that they could maybe go back and work on three or four uh, elements, bring that to us in kind of a rolling fashion for review, and we could say, no, this is probably enough detail here. But then we say, oh no, this one. We definitely want uh, more detail and put that on the white paper, multiple meeting path, and not just necessarily plan it for all of them. Can we, can we do it in a rolling fashion? Uh, do you see a way yes. forward there? I think that if we look at the schedule that is on page, page four, it shows that we've grouped the different white paper topics and we're going um, to um, ZDRB and council and moving forward in pairs um, of topics. We think that they're, um, they're pretty big so that we want to take them together. So for example, um, we would take... Uh, I, I'm still looking for page four. What document are you it's on? It's the so revised scope of work. The oh, third the revised. attachment, okay. which Not is the staff revised report. scope of work. So okay. um, for example, we could consider um, the study sessions for north of Washington and Humboldt. At the same time, we're looking at um, the Catholic Church mix mixed residential. So we've grouped a lot of it together. Um, we're trying to find um, similar um, topics that go together. But we work on those, get those moving forward, and then start the next set and um, to fall within these three different phases for adoption at the council. Further question? Are you looking at it? Um, yeah, I looked at this and I didn't. Uh, 
Are we talking about the schedule with the, the pink dots and the blue dots? Yes, yeah, so green this dots? schedule um, identifies council's subcommittee meeting. That's really the ad hoc committee. It would start first with the ad hoc committee, get some direction um, on the white paper, and then we would take that later to both CDRB and council um, for feedback. Then we'd start drafting the ordinance. Then we'd work on the next batch. Yeah. And we're looking yeah, at I'm definitely all. not into another ad hoc. I don't want any more working groups, and I don't want to make a decision about a white paper unless uh, I know, okay, we need a white paper on this, and, and why. So um, I'm willing to, if, if there's some, again, low-hanging fruit about some design ordinances uh, or zoning ordinances that, you know, you want to update, right. pick some, and bring them to us, and if, if we're all fine with them, then why would we go off on this very, very time-consuming consuming path without even knowing what we're... Well, the 14 um, items that we think are worth discussing are on pages um, 2 and 3 of the revised proposal. Two and three, okay. We are, we believe the white paper approach is the best way to get down to the issues and get direction on how to move forward. That direction... Okay. I'm sorry, the, maybe because the hour is late. What page has the Two. 14... White Task papers? three identifies white papers. It's the third attachment, at, which is the yeah. revised proposal. I am on the revised proposal. Pages what page? Two and three. Two. Oh, two and three. We're backing up. I kept moving forward. Okay. Um, yeah. Again, I. That's still where uh, I'm landing. I just, uh, I really want to kind of see the ordinances. Uh, you know, a, a few of them as they develop, and. Uh, and, and see if they're okay or if we need more detail. It seems to be a bit of a black box I need, I'm making a decision on, and I, uh, it's, it seems too complicated for me. So that's where I am right now. Okay. Vice Mayor. Uh, thank you. Um, so I concur uh, with Council Members Durham and Doran Becker I think this is the time to put together a complete package. I think it is very um, important for us to, as we look at some of these, not just the change areas, but the new areas identified, um, and, and I think the change areas too, to, to get some design information in there too, so that we get a complete knowledge of, of what we're trying to do to implement our general plan. Um, I am in favor of an ad hoc, and I think that it needs to be a, um, a, a hardworking ad hoc. Not that they all aren't, but I think this will be a particularly heavy lift. And I think where an ad hoc could really help is to maybe narrow the scope of some of these. As the ad hoc goes forward, it could say, you know, we've seen the beginnings of a white paper on this, or we've heard a skeleton of this. We don't think, we think we could just report to council without having further um, consultant time. So I think I like the concept very much. Um, I'm not that enamored with the price. I do think there are some savings to be achieved. You've already called out about 20,000. I think we probably could get another 20 out of there and come in somewhere closer to 175. And I would ask uh, the ad hoc to work on that. Um, but I, I think it, uh, it just makes sense. Um, we've done things the other way where an ordinance comes and you haven't had really input and then staff goes back again and has to redo it. I am willing, certainly willing to try it the other way this time and say, let's get some input first. I think the ad hoc would need to be committed to reporting out to the council as often as necessary and meeting you know, maybe the ad hoc decides it doesn't need 11 or 9 or 7. Maybe it's happy with half that. And then our price goes down. So that's, I like the concept. Um, I would like to, for the ad hoc to have some leeway in the implementation of it. Thank you. I'm looking and don't remember seeing, was this brought to the ZRB for consideration? No. We don't have an opinion from them whether they love or hate the idea of being I'll say forced into all of this further. Well, we've been in discussions with them that they'll be deeply involved in this process and that we would have monthly or bi-monthly meetings with them to go over this, um, these work items so they're aware that that's coming. 
Hmm. But no, they haven't seen the proposal, and <laughs> maybe they don't know the number. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I also want to get some clarity here, staff-wise. Where are you all on this? Um, I want to hear from you, Gary, Steve. Um, the time we're talking about, I'm not as concerned about the money of this. I agree th with the idea of after 20 years and two years of, of Envision Yomphil, we want to make sure that we get a complete product. Um, but you're going to be holding, you know, handling the majority of the load, and Gary, you will, and Steve. So I, I don't get a sense yet of if you all like this new proposal, hate it, or you, you just stuck with whatever we – um, take I'll action take, on. I'll take the first step. I don't want you to take the first one. I want to hear no, from I, them. No, I, I have to on this one, John, in all fairness. You ask a very good question. And what I'm going to tell you is, and I'll use the cannabis discussion we've been having for two and a half years, this process, because we put you into and the community into the thought process before we draft something, we think has value. I want to be really honest about that. So it's an effort, you know, it's, we're not going to be naive and tell you that this is not going to be a all staff consuming process, very similar to the general plan. But I'm going to be very honest. We think the upfront shift could potentially, while it will take longer, it should result in a better product because there's nothing more frustrating than we've watched you when you take a draft and go, well, where'd that come from? What's this? You know, you've got certain things. So we think in many ways it will, it'll speed up that process and allow better community discussion of what should that mean. So, I mean, I want to be very honest. Staff, we, we think this could be a good outcome, and, and it came about because of the questions and the feedback that you had when we presented the concept. So I want to be really clear on that. If you're asking, do you, we think there's merit and is this a good process? Yes. Is it worth what's going to be needed is what I'm asking. That's why I really wanted to hear from oh, the people that are going to be sacrificing their time on all other things that we keep asking for to do this. It feels like this is one of those times when consultants will build whatever you want them to build at the grandest scale because they get paid. And it, do we really need it to get a, a, a good outcome? I get Councilmember Durham's point, like, to paraphrase, don't cut corners now. We put all this effort in, and let's make sure that it's, it's you know, 100% as best as we can get it, it just feels to me like it's excessive. And again, I would be prepared to make the budget adjustment if I felt like it was worth it, and I'm not convinced it's worth it yet. So if the other two of you can convince me otherwise, um, because I thought we've been cruising along. Gary, you've been able to make updates and adjustments, and we look at some new language, and it's – it's good. I think that kind of goes to Councilmember Moeller's point of um, piece by piece, but maybe that's not the best way to do it. Maybe it's this all-inclusive package. So, yeah. So what I what I would add to that is the state zoning law requires the council to update the zoning code and bring it into compliance with the general plan within a quote reasonable amount of time after you update your general plan. You started that process right after the general plan was, was adopted, so you're already on that path. And I think that continuing this process meets that requirement. It, do, it is currently out of compliance, though, and that does need to be brought into compliance. So there are those inconsistencies on the face that need to be fixed immediately. There are broader questions about zoning code and land use regulation that can go in about as many different directions as the council wants to go. And so one of the upshot to having a process like this is that you can consider and discuss all the different options and see where you want to go rather than getting a finished product and saying, here it is, and having to decide on sort of a broad scale 
and a lot of details that maybe you want to be involved in, maybe you don't want to be involved in. But you know, general plans are on a 10-year cycle, sometimes longer. Zoning codes are very long, and comprehensive updates sometimes don't come up uh, for 10, 20, or longer years. I work with some zoning codes in some cities that were last updated in 1974. Oh. So there's an opportunity here, and there's a lot of different options in details about the minutia of land use regulation that, frankly, require a lot of time and effort, not just on your part, but staff's part, and it's a heavy lift. And it can be as detailed and involved as you want to be. This could be a process where, not to scare anybody, you could sit here and, and meet eight hours a day for the next year and have these discussions. Oh, no, um, I'm not suggesting that you do so. Uh, but there's a lot of options and there's a lot of detail there. And so I think what staff's trying to do here, if I'm reading between the lines, is there's an opportunity to have a more detailed discussion that might allow you to dig into some of these more complicated issues. And I agree with that. I think we can do oh, the gosh, simple sir. cleanup <laughs> fixes that are identified as the general plan and our zoning ordinance will work, but our zoning ordinance is old and I think this is kind of an exciting opportunity to look at all these different topics and discuss them and decide do we like how it's working or do we want to change how it is and this simply provides that opportunity. We may decide yes to move forward or no. Um, I will also note that the contract is a not to exceed amount, which our past contracts with this consultant have been, and that our experience has been that they tend to estimate high but come in lower. Um, for the general plan, so, it was 155000 was the cost for the general plan, their portion of the general plan, and they came in $25,000 under, which was about 16%. So. Um, I think we might be able to expect something similar here, especially based on the result of some of those white paper outcomes where we're, we move forward yes or we don't and we don't expend the money on it. Um, I do think it's positive. And so staff and potentially the ad hoc committee and potentially the council decide when those scopes of work that are in process stop. Yes. We feel, I think it was... One of you made the point of, if we feel like we've, I think it was you, that we we got as much as we need to get out of this, then you don't have to go to the next pink or blue box and keep doing it because we said so in the scope of work. Because okay. um, it allows that informed decision. I think this process. Right. Okay. Staff is compelling, <laughs> but staff better look out for what they support in this one. Um, I say that facetiously, but um, okay. Is there any further discussion or action to be taken? I'll make a motion. Uh, I make a motion that we adopt resolution number 19-3572, approving a professional service agreement with O'Rourke and Associates for additional consulting services associated with the update of the zoning ordinance and general plan policy implementation in the amount not to exceed $116,845. Oh, and then to appoint two council members to the Zodo Ad Hoc Committee. Are we going to need to take those two separately? I thought I heard, well, I'm not going to say who I heard. <laughs> Volunteer, I think Councilmember Durham was definitely one of them. Mm -hmm. Parking. Up <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt your motion as you were about to finish so it. So, do you want me? Would you like the motion just to be the first part, and then we'll no, discuss? I was, I oh, mean, okay. It, no, I've I've only heard the vice mayor just volunteered. Uh, if there are two volunteers, I would I would ask they do that. Otherwise, <laughs> we're going to have to figure out the ad hoc. I can make a substitute motion if you get a second. Well, we don't have one yet. He had, I interrupted his motion. And he didn't even oh. finish it. So, and then to appoint two council members to the Zoto Ad Hoc Committee. So that's my motion. Yeah, but you need to identify who those two are. So, or if you want to take it in two parts, does it matter, Gary? That might be easier. All right. Well, all right. There's a motion that doesn't identify the Ad Hoc Committee yet. I'll um, second that. Okay. And I will just say, oh. Gary, you're compelling about this because, you know, amortizing over 20 years is kind of what I'm hearing from both of you that 
the additional hundred plus thousand dollars almost guarantees us that this thing's going to be good for two decades ish. Okay, so there's a motion and a second on everything except for the ad hoc committee mm -hmm. uh, membership. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No, that's unanimous. So, are there volunteers or is there a motion to compel people to be on the ad hoc committee? I think, Vice Mayor, you volunteered. I did. did you still volunteer? I do still, yes. Yes. Councilman Durham? No. I thought, we were, I, I'm, I thought we were going to separate those two because I was going to make, okay, then I make a motion, let's see where it goes, that we don't have the ad hoc. Is the ad hoc critical to this process? It serves as an advisory group to the council as a whole. And if you. I, mean, I kind of like for, for the council to see all the white papers and have all the meetings and, mm -hmm. and, and work together without the ad hoc. No, I it, wouldn't support that at all. I mean, so this is how we operate. We get people to drill down on uh, information so that it's m more reasonable for the entire council to evaluate. In my opinion, this would be a perfect example of that. I mean, we do it for virtually everything else. We have ad I don't know how many ad hoc committees we have, but this seems like the most appropriate one of all. I see it. So now the question is if, I mean, Let me in there. someone that has been, I can't guarantee availability for the kind of schedule that's being proposed here, to be perfectly honest. I just can't. So process question, what happens if, let's say, two of us are appointed and one of us can't make the meeting? Can the ad hoc, can the remaining ones still come and how does that work, Gary? Sure. Then it's not an ad hoc meeting, but yes, the one person can go. And get the information and disseminate it to the other ad hoc member? Yes. Okay. I make a motion to appoint the vice mayor and the mayor to you the- better not look this way. To, I'm looking this way, to the uh, Zoto ad hoc committee. I'm not even gonna ask for a second until I get to, so the person that was most opposed to extending the scope of work, you're really gonna ask to be on this committee. When other people were totally behind the extended scope of work and are not volunteering. I'm still will, willing to really discuss, do we need the ad hoc to, to do this? I mean, what would be the consequence of not having uh, an ad hoc? Heavier workload without direction on the white papers at the council. Rather why than can't, to if we're going to have 13 meetings, why can't we talk about it as a council? Okay. Yeah. yeah. If you don't have an ad hoc, then it can happen in the context of a meeting. So those can be updates, either joint meetings with the ZDRB or individual meetings of the council. It can be an informational update and discussion item as part of the meeting or as a special meeting before regular meeting as you did today for another topic. So there is a motion on the floor that's awaiting a second. I will second. Further discussion? Do a point or two. Just in case somebody's going to step up instead. I mean, I, I don't think it's appropriate for the entire council to do it. So sure. if nobody else is, then you all so three can compel me. So. so there is a motion and a second that the mayor and the vice mayor are the ad hoc committee for this. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I abstain. <laughs> no, I'll support it. Just kidding. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of the council, we will make it as pain-free as possible. That's not possible. <laughs> That's okay. It's an important issue, no question. I mean, I'm making light of it, and I don't want to come across like it's not serious. So um, I do hope that uh, meeting schedules are going to be um, reasonable. We talk about, what do we say, if somebody can't make it, then it just reports out by the one member? Correct. Okay. Okay. I don't even know where we are on the agenda anymore. That one hurt. 10 e. I know, I'm e. kidding. Not done, I know that. I'm kidding. Um, zoning and Design Review Board appointments. No, we just did that. Community. No, we didn't. Oh, Community Foundation, we want to do that first, sorry. Oh. No, I know what we just did. <laughs> I'm very clear on what we just did. <laughs> Uh-oh. Community Foundation appointments. So yeah, I'm losing it right now. 
Community so, Foundation, yes, Michelle. The council interviewed um, four applicants earlier this evening, and one had to withdraw. And at the conclusion of the um, vote tallies, the first person ranked as Sandy Fagan at 22. Second is Hillary Tripper at 21. And third is Darlene D. Buclair at 17. And then there's one, that was for the resident category. And then for the chamber res, res representative, there's one person and that's Jessica Penman. And council uh, unanimously supported her to be reappointed to the Yountville Community Foundation. So we have one position to appoint to the Community Foundation and the um, highest number of votes came for Sandy Fagan to be reappointed with 22. Two positions, one for resident, one for chamber. Yes, that's yeah. right. One okay. resident, one chamber. And so, so with that, I would ask for a motion to appoint Sandy Fagan and Jessica Penman. Reappoint. Reappoint, yes. Both. I uh, move the appointment of, reappointment of Sandy Fagan to the Yountville Community Foundation as the resident representative and the reappointment of Jessica Penman as the Chamber of Commerce representative with terms of office to commence August 1, 2019 and expire August 1, 2021. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. I would just say in both cases, the one we just handled and the next one, that we had all very good candidates and we're very pleased to have that option <laughs> Uh, it doesn't always happen that we have uh, sure what are difficult you. choices to make, which is we have too many good people at once. So hopefully others that were not selected at this uh, this time will come forward next time. So with that, we go on to the ZDRB appointment. Yes, thank you. Um, council again interviewed three applicants for one position earlier this evening. And at the end of the vote tallies, we have... Um, the one position tied between Lawrence Kamer and Michael Jordan with uh, followed up with Nathaniel Dorn. So um, okay. council would need to make a well, decision. Well, again, as a reminder, the scoring is not a requirement, so w a motion can still be made for, um, I mean, it would be appropriate for one of the two tied members. I'll make a motion that we appoint Larry Kamer to that position. To I'll second. second it. All right, all I'll in favor? A substitute motion that we appoint um, Michael Jordan. Is there a second to that? With I'll second that. Okay, so that substitute motion goes first. Yep. All in favor of the substitute motion to nominate or appoint uh, Michael Jordan to the position. Please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No? No. Are you voting? Aye. Okay, so that's three ayes, right? Apparently. Yeah. You're, uh, you're yes to Michael Jordan? Um, yes. Okay, so that is three to two. Michael Jordan is appointed. Okay. Thank so you. So the first motion is no moved. No longer, yes. And again, thank you to all three uh, gentlemen that came forward. Um, very much appreciated and hope they will consider future opportunities. Uh, town Council protocols update. Mayor this Council. is more than 30 seconds, Steve. We're going to continue this. <laughs> no, my point to you is I was about to recommend that given where you're at, that this be continued because you are going to need to spend. That. We're very close but it's your protocols and your edits, but given the dialogue tonight, I'm going to suggest that this is not the time for that conversation. Do we need a formal vote on that? No. To continue it? All right, staff informational reports? You have one informational report that I think stands for itself as it relates to um, staff is recommending that we discontinue going forward with review of the ADU impact fee adjustments as there's four uh, current pieces of legislation at different variable places that could result in either eliminating the ability to have impact fees for ADUs or putting a formula in place and it probably is prudent for us to wait until the closure of the legislative session and see what direction they've gone and then we will bring something back to you at that point in time. Okay, very good. 
Any other reports? No? Okay, council meeting reports. Uh, no report from flood control. Uh, is there a WIC report? No. It's okay if no? No. Okay. LAFCO? Uh, I'll defer to the next meeting. Okay, good. Lee, California Cities, um, I have been asked to testify next, let's see, August 13th, I think that's Wednesday. Uh, related to Governor Newsom's executive order regarding excess state-owned property for housing development. Uh, and I look forward to that uh, opportunity. I will be bringing up the uh, work that's been done related to the Veterans Home uh, and other housing opportunities in Napa County, uh, making sure that they, um, if they qualify, that we'll be able to move forward with the state's support. Uh, we are still waiting on the Department of General Services to release its inventory list of uh, priority state-owned properties. Their original uh, deadline was July, um, so we're waiting on that. Uh, also, the budget trailer bills that um, have come out since the governor's budget are in the League of California Cities staff's minds, very favorable to local government which is good. Uh, there is funding and incentive programs for housing development. So it's not just state mandate this time. It's actually uh, backed up by some funding opportunities. So that's a good thing for local governments. Reports, uh, did you want to report on the Thank school you. district? Yes, um, a brief report on the school district. They have published their list of the Persons to be recommended to the trustees for the 7-Eleven committee that uh, the trustees will meet this week on August 8th. Um, the uh, recommended appointees include um, Eric Housley and Eric Knight, who have Yachtville ties. I have been recommended as an alternate member. Um, I also have some notes from the meeting that uh, Supervisor Musetti asked the mayor and I to attend on July 18th. Superintendent. I'm sorry, Superintendent Musetti. That's getting my, past my bedtime, sorry. Um, which are sort of lengthy, so I will just uh, hit a couple of high points and next time give a more in-depth report. Um, the committee work may be in two parts. It will be up to the committee. One part would be the closure and the second part would be the property use and disposition. They could be collapsed into one. Um, the recommendation, Ray, a possible relocation of Stonebridge will be a task for the committee. And the committee should not look at particular schools, rather at the entire issue of financial straits and declining enrollment. And those are kind of the high points and themes of what the committee will be expected to do. And I do intend to go to the school board meeting on Thursday evening. That is when they're... Uh acting on those recommendations. Thank you. Um, very quickly, the Napa Town and Country Fair opens tomorrow, runs through Sunday down in Napa. The Napa Valley Crush Cancer 5K Run and Walk, as we recognized earlier tonight, is on Sunday, starting at the Yonville Community Center. Then the following Saturday, August 17th, is the Be Kind Walk that will start at Veterans Memorial Park and uh, meander through town and ultimately end up at the museum at the Veterans Home. And then I also want, since we are not having another meeting this month and uh, believe we also are not meeting on September 2nd, wanted to just remind folks uh, ahead of time, I will be holding uh, with everyone's invitation at the annual remembrance on September 11th at our community center, 728 AM, Wednesday, September 11th, uh, to remember uh, the lives lost and changed by the terror attacks of September 11th, uh, 18 years ago. Hard to believe it's 18 years. Um, is that? Go ahead. Councilmember Dorn Becker, ready? she's ready Friday to party. Friday evening, we have the uh, town-wide bash, uh, birthday bash. Which is sold out. Which is sold out, yay. Those are all the announcements I have. Is there any further? 
Seeing that we do have one closed session item, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, go into closed session. Is there any anticipated action? Yes. Okay. So uh, we will go out into closed session, and uh, we're, we will report out any action taken. If you are not watching at the end of this, we will be then adjourning to our ne next meeting of September 17th. So with that, we'll go into closed session.